So it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome everybody here in the room today, but also all those of you who are joining us online for the live stream. My name is Tisa Sherry. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Behavioral Health, Disability, and Aging Policy in HHS's Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, or ASPE for short. Um, I have the privilege of serving as our moderator for today's HHS Summit. Support is here to strengthen mental health. We have an absolutely incredible program ahead of us today to recognize and honor May Mental Health Awareness a Month. As you'll see from our agenda, we've pulled together leaders across HHS, the White House, Congress, state and local partners, providers, and the community-based organizations who together make all of our work to address the nation's mental health crisis possible. Um, I encourage all of you who are um, engaging on social media um, to use our photo wall um, right over there. Um, also, the hashtag we'll be using for this event is hashtag strength and mental health. This event has been organized by HHS's Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs. So I'll now welcome Jessica Smith, the Principal Deputy Director of this office, to the stage to provide a few short opening remarks ahead of Secretary Becerra. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tisa. Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to HHS and our summit. Support is here to strengthen mental health. I'm Jess Smith, uh, the Principal Deputy Director of the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs here at HHS. And at IEA, we consider ourselves the front door of the department, so we are very pleased that you found your way through our front door this morning, through security, through our turnstiles, uh, it is nice to have you here in, in the building. Uh, uh, it's especially meaningful for a conversation like this to have you in person. Uh, it's lovely to see so many faces, uh, to have you bring your energy, your partnership, your camaraderie here and energy to the building. Before we dive in, I want to uh, give a special thanks to our staff in IEA and especially Zach Kahan, who is here somewhere in the room. Um, Zach was the driving force uh, behind the summit, and I want to thank him uh, particularly. We have a meaningful day planned for you today, um, including some exciting announcements that we will share with you shortly. We hope that this summit provides you an opportunity to dialogue with each other and take away tangible resources back to your communities. From day one, Secretary Becerra and the whole of the Biden-Harris administration have been committed to addressing the breadth of mental health challenges facing our country. And so today you're going to hear from speakers who will engage around three elements of the administration's mental health strategy. The first is strengthening system capacity and supporting a very stressed healthcare workforce. The second is, is connecting Americans to care. And the third is supporting Americans by creating healthy environments. Um, as Tisa mentioned, we have with us today uh, White House officials, HHS leadership, and leaders like you who are on the front lines of this work. During lunch today, we'll have the opportunity to network. Some of our speakers and our principals will be here in the room. Uh, we encourage you to get to know them, get to know us, get to know each other. Um, this summit will be made even more meaningful uh, if you build relationships, take them back with you. Uh, that will give this experience uh, legs and staying power. We know that this work uh, takes a community. At the end of the day, we will have HHS resource tables where you can meet firsthand with our program specialists from all of our HHS operating divisions. So these are our, all of our acronyms of SAMHSA, ACL, ACF, uh, HRSA, the CDC, and we'll also have the Office of the Surgeon General here with us today. So please stay, interact with our team. Uh, as Tisa mentioned, use the photo wall. Uh, we hope that you will join us on social media with the hashtag strengthen mental health. Um, and I want to, in just a moment, introduce our HHS secretary, uh, my boss, Secretary Javier Becerra. He is a fierce champion of mental health and for the past two years under his leadership, 
the department's focus has shifted from one of reactive illness care toward a system that values and prioritizes preventive health and wellness. And part of that is the investment in codifying mental health and well-being as health care. This work is so important. We are privileged to be able to get to do this work in partnership with all of you. And without further ado, I want to introduce Secretary Javier Becerra. Jess, thank you very much. Great to see so many people. As Jess said, great that you were able to make it through the door. By the way, I hope you get into the habit of making it through the door because I think for those who have worked for the longest time in mental health, it's been tough to get through the door. Actually, it's been tough to find the door, right? It's, uh, oftentimes they hide it. And uh, whether it's insurance companies, whether it's been government services, it's been just tough to find the door. And so to each and every one of you for fighting real hard to figure out where that door was, but for getting through that door. Uh, we want to invite you in all the time because we're not done. We have a lot we want to do and I will make a couple of announcements about just how wide open we want that door to be for you. Uh, if I can start by saying to our team, and you're going to hear from Dr. Sherry and many of the folks that have worked hard on this, we have many of our leaders from our different agencies that are very active here as well. This is a special month because we think we have things to talk about as we try to acknowledge those who have worked really hard to get the care that their loved ones need. And especially for our children, uh, it is a great opportunity to really plant the seed of how important it is for us to finally break through and make sure that when we say health, we include mental health. And no longer do we have to distinguish between the two. And so as we talk about these things, I hope you will help us get past that door. We have a president who has given us license to really ram through that door. And he just didn't talk it, he walked it in making sure his budget proposed more resources for mental health services than ever before presented by a president of the United States. I hope, <clears throat> I hope you recognize how, how intentional the president is in saying, go through that door. But he has to, because when nine of every 10 Americans is telling you that America has experienced a mental health crisis, we're already behind. And so it is so important, it is indispensable for you all to just knock down that door. We're gonna be there. In fact, we'll probably hand you the battering ram to do it. And so let's work this together. And so whether it's the work that we did with the president's support to more than, by a factor of 20, increase the funding for 988, so that in July of 2022, not only did we launch 988, but we did it in ways that people did not expect. We, that's right, that's right. We are seeing people call, actually what we're seeing is young people call. Actually, we're seeing young people text. It's amazing, right? But we're getting people to call. And here's the best news. When they reach out, we're actually answering. You're not, you're not put on hold. Yeah. You don't get a busy signal. You're getting someone who responds. Here's the next task. After you keep them from taking that wrong fork in the road, we got to deliver the service that they need, that they expect, that will say to them, I have a friend who's about to do the same thing, but now I know where they, where they can go because when, when I call 988, not just that I have a, someone to comfort me and work with me, but they direct me to someone who actually gave me professional services. That's what we want to do. 
That's why the CCBHCs, the Certified uh, Behavioral Health uh, Centers, are going to be so important because it's not just nine to five that people have a crisis. And so, 24/7 now, we're going to be <clears throat> we're going to be ready to offer the help that people need. And that's why it wasn't just 988. It's not just the CCBHCs that are important, but this website that we're launching today, which in the minds of many people may be nothing, but findsupport.gov, if you're not yet there at that crisis point where the fork in the road is looking at you and you're not sure which way you're going to go, 988 is going to be a blessing. It has been a blessing. But what if you're a few steps ahead of that point in, in the road? Why should you have to wait to hit the fork? Why not know how to navigate that road ahead of time? FindSupport.gov is just a basic way of saying to you, look, let's help you navigate this so you never get to that fork. Or let, tell your friend how to do it. Something very simple we should have done a long time ago. But we're going to do it. And I'm thrilled to announce that we were serious. The president was serious when he said at the State of the Union that we're going to tackle this aggressively and we're going to make sure we reach out to our children. And so we're going to put out a challenge round of a million dollars so that you all can compete and give us the best ideas on how to reach our kids before it's too late. Because it is insane in a country as wealthy and as advanced as ours to have nine and 10 year olds contemplating suicide. And so the work is ahead of us. Our kids need us. Or as I always tell folks, I learned this before I was an adult from my mom. Mejor prevenir que remediar. Better to prevent than to remediate. And so it is time for us to recognize that we can do that with our children right now. And so I want to thank each of you during this month that we recognize the importance of providing mental health services to our American family that we can make a difference. You can walk through that door. We can partner and get things done. But most importantly, we can prevent that person from getting to that fork in the road. We can prevent the loss of that loved one. We can prevent someone having the sense of discouragement that no one is there for them by making sure we're there early. And we can together make sure that we have shown America that when we speak health, we mean every form of health. And so I encourage you to just bulldoze. Uh, or as I tell my team here, never do mild. When you're put in a position to make a difference, never do mild. I invite you to join us and never do mild. And so thank you for coming. Thank you to my team that has worked this so very hard. Thank you for those of you who knew way, way, way long ago that it was important to let people get through that door. Thank you for walking into this building with us. Let me now turn it over to you, the people who will make it happen at HHS. Let me invite Dr. Sherry, Tisa Marie Sherry, to please come up. Join us, push us, be bold, never do mild. We will make a difference, and we will make people understand what it means to recognize a month that is for those who forever could never find the door. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Secretary Becerra, for those passionate, inspiring open remarks. Um, but also, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Secretary for his incredible vision and leadership in championing mental health support on behalf of HHS, but also all of the American people. Under Secretary Becerra's leadership, our, the entire weight of our department has driven towards expanding access to mental health care and delivering on the president's ambitious national mental health strategy. So thank you again, Mr. Secretary. Now, as many of you know, the mental health workforce is really the heart and soul of our delivery system. Delivery system wouldn't exist without them. But unfortunately, we simply don't have enough behavioral health providers right now to meet the needs. Also, um, this is particularly the case in rural and underserved communities. 
For this reason, system capacity and strengthening system capacity through investing in workforce has been a key focus of both the President's National Mental Health Strategy and also our HHS Roadmap for Behavioral Health Integration, which is guiding our department's efforts. There's no better person to speak to the incredible investments that our department is making in strengthening the mental health workforce than the administrator of our um, Health Resources and Services Administration, Carol Johnson. Uh, administrator Johnson directs HRSA, which is one of the leading federal agencies providing support for uh, expanding the capacity of our behavioral health workforce. Um, and she has a really uh, remarkable record of public service, um, both at HHS, um, but also serving in the White House, tackling issues such as COVID-19, implementing the Affordable Care Act, um, and also previously serving as the commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Human Services. We're so delighted that Administrator Johnson will be joining us today for a fireside chat, where she'll be interviewed by the Deputy Chief of Staff, Angela Ramirez. Before welcoming them up here, uh, just a friendly reminder um, to anybody who may be looking for a place to sit that we still have a number of seats down in the front row, so don't be afraid to come on up. Um, all right, with that, um, I will turn it over to Administrator Johnson and Deputy Chief of Staff Ramirez. Good morning. How's everyone doing? We can call in response. And look at that, they asked for seats in the front and lo, it comes to pass. Uh, it's so wonderful to see everyone and I am so honored to be sitting next to Administrator Johnson. Uh, I'm gonna say just a few remarks uh, building off the Secretary's comments of opening the door and walking through it. Um, I know people in this room know that we are in a mental health crisis. I don't have to say that, but I think it's important to say. And for many people, particularly young people, people of color, people from underserved communities, the, it is more than a crisis, it is dire. But what you don't always hear as much about, but you will today, are about the people who provide the care and support to those who are managing their mental illness and how they are managing. We are facing another crisis a crisis of healthcare professionals, especially those who work in mental health. With rising numbers of cases and the growing severity of cases, mental health professionals are feeling overwhelmed, exhausted. Many of them, quite frankly, have their own mental health issues to deal with. But President Biden is not afraid to take on tough challenges, thank goodness. And he has committed this administration to provide the necessary help and investment to help us heal and move forward with resilience. Secretary Becerra and HHS have stepped up and provided a whole of government appro approach, making this a priority inside and critically important, as you folks know, outside of this building. Last year, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy sounded the alarm in his advisory addressing health worker burnout. And then the year since its release, we have made great strides to confront the long-standing drivers of burnout among our health workers. Still, this situation has been years in the making and it won't be solved quickly. We hear stats all the time, but this one always strikes me. One in five physicians and nearly 40% of nurses report that they might leave their current practice in the next two years. Just sit with that stat for a second, 40% in the next two years. So when we say support is here, we mean support for everyone, especially the doctors, nurses, counselors, and everyone else who is a part of our mental health infrastructure. It's no small task, we know that, and that's why strengthening system capacity is one of President Biden's strategies in addressing our, health, our mental health crisis and why it is one of the most important things this department is tackling. Now, that's the, that's the challenge. 
here's the solution. I am thrilled, thrilled to be here with Carol Johnson, the administrator of HRSA, who is leading our efforts in this area. I could spend an entire panel on Carol, Carol's experience uh, responding to Ebola and Zika, the opioid crisis, as part of the Biden administration, she organized medical personnel and first responders at the very height of COVID uh, under Delta. It's incredible to have her here and there is genuinely nobody with a deeper understanding of what is required of our workforce in response to a public health emergency and what it takes to replenish our ranks. And that's why we're here today, to talk about the steps we're taking to strengthen our system capacity what impact it will have on our efforts to manage the mental health crisis, and how to prepare to go forward. So, let's dive in. I have questions, Carol will have answers. All of the steps this administration is taking to advance access to mental health and substance use disorder services, from launching CCBC, BHCs, to expanding Medicare access to providers like marriage and family therapists, strengthening and building the 988 and crisis response teams. All of these things depend on having a skilled, high quality workforce. Um, can you talk about how this administration is growing the mental health and substance use disorder workforce as a, in prioritizing it? Thanks so much, Angela, and thank you and the team for organizing today. The lights are bright, but I see so many friends in the audience. Um, and so I just wanna start by thanking those of you who are here um, and those who are watching the live stream who've been at this work for decades, um, we are able to take the kind of actions we're taking as an administration because this community has built a network that we can stand on, that we can continue to leverage, that has built an advocacy voice that helps us secure the resources to be able to do that. So thank you to everyone for that incredible work. Um, if I could, I'd like to just step back for a second and talk about the fact that um, I had the uh, uh, opportunity to work with the president when he was the vice president on mental health issues. Some of the very first money we ever gave to health centers um, to expand opioid treatment was because the vice president made that happen. We did early intervention work um, in expanding access to mental health treatment in schools, um, in, in our work to build our mental health and substance use disorder training programs because the vice president led that work. So there is no surprise that the president in this moment would make, recognize and make mental health and substance use disorder services a key part of his unity agenda. And then to have Secretary Becerra be the lead to implement it is such a gift to all of us because um, the secretary, whether um, uh, in a room full of insurance executives or a room full of community members, is focused on how underserved and hard to reach communities are getting access to services. Um, and so that's the wind at our back. That's the sail that is helping us do this critical work. And what we have been able to do is commit to, um, in the president's budget, in fiscal year 24, we have a um, close to $400 million proposed investment in expanding our training programs for mental health and substance use disorder providers. We yes. can clap, we can clap. It's a huge win. It's a $190 million increase. With those resources, we anticipate that we could train 18,000 new providers. Um, and there is not a person in this field who won't tell you that the critical need today is the workforce. Um, it's actually really sort of striking. Um, I, you know, have been, as you, you mentioned, been around for a while. I've been around for a while, and you know, often the first conversation you have with folks is about reimbursement. And reimbursement remains an issue and will continue to remain an issue. But in recent years, the first conversation you have with folks is about the workforce. Uh, finding and, and, and sustaining and maintaining a high quality uh, workforce um, is a critical need 
and is a testament to the people who do this work, right? People who've been doing this work for a really long time um, are just dedicated. And I know from my experience in New Jersey, we're finding ways throughout the early days in the pandemic to make sure that recovery supports were maintained, that people could get access to providers. Um, that was heroic work, um, and it has made a huge difference in so many people's lives. But we need more people in the field, and we need more people to take up that call. And that's why we're investing um, in training more providers, psychologists, licensed clinical social workers, marriage and family therapists, counselors, but not just people with advanced degrees, peer support specialists, community health workers, we all know, everyone who does this work knows that it's not just what, ha what happens in a conversation like this, it's what happens when you're back in your community. And, and peer support specialists, people with lived experience, are able to connect people to care, help retain people in care. It makes such a critical difference. Um, and so our, our support is about both um, and about that whole continuum of, of the training pipeline. We also, as many of you may know, invest in loan repayment programs. So for those folks who we don't support directly in their training, helping people uh, repay their loans as part of an incentive program to encourage people to practice in the communities that need them most. And so we've been able to substantially grow our investment in mental health and substance use providers practicing in high need communities thanks to both the National Health Service Corps program and the STAR Loan Repayment Program, which I know many people in this, uh, in this audience have advocated for over the years. And so there's much more work to do, um, but, but I hope that you take away from this conversation the fact that we know good policy also requires good implementation. And we can't deliver on all the policy that we are working so hard to achieve if there aren't people on the ground who are able to do that critical work. And we're committed to both action on policy and making sure that there's a workforce to deliver on those critical services. That's a great point. It really does come up in almost every conversation I'm in, whether it's reimbursement or job training, eventually we land at workforce, it feels like. So you're not wrong at all. Um, back to my list of questions. Uh, in addition to the work HRSA is doing to train and grow the behavioral health workforce, I have heard you say many times, again, in the building, outside the building, on the road, that we need to expand the definition of primary care uh, so that it's including mental health and substance use. How are we making that a priority and, and expanding the workforce needed to respond to behavioral health needs? So thank you for the question. It is um, a passion of mine um, that as long as I get to sit in this chair, that we're doing everything possible to make it so there's no wrong door for people to get mental health and substance use disorder services. And as the secretary said, you know, we want people to walk through the door. We need to be ready when people walk through the door. Um, and where they're raising their hand, where they've ha taken the opportunity to say, I need help, we need to be ready to provide that help. And that means we need to make sure that mental health is part of primary care. Um, we, uh, you know, we obviously need all the critical services that we are investing in and building for people with complex mental health conditions, CCBHCs, all the work we're doing on crisis response. Um, but when someone comes to their primary care provider, when someone comes to their pediatrician and says that they need support, we need to be able to do that. That's why we're investing in, our, in training pediatricians in mental health services, in providing real-time teleconsultation to mental health providers so that pediatricians can access expertise quickly and you don't have to refer someone and you know it might take months for them to get access to mental health supports. Um, and that's why our budget also says for the 1,400 community health centers around the country that operate close to 15,000 sites for underserved communities and in rural communities where people get care regardless of their ability to pay, those primary care sites should also deliver mental health and substance use disorder services, and we're investing in and committing to changing the requirements for those programs so that mental health and substance use is part of the core work of community health centers. That's tremendous, absolutely. I just, I swell with excitement every time you talk about these things. It's so exciting. Um, and I'm going to ask a question now um, that's really uh, personal to me and my family. We come from, as sometimes is written down, rural America. Uh, but HRSA leads our rural health policy work. 
and supports the delivery of health services to thousands of underserved communities across the country. How are you addressing getting the behavioral workforce to some of these communities that are hard to reach and often need it the most? Yeah, it is such a critical need, um, and it is why we have a dedicated program uh, in our rural work uh, focused on opioids um, that is a door for us into many other services that we're able to provide in rural communities. At the end of last year, we did a $100 million investment in rural communities. The $100 million goes a very long way when you're able to dedicate it to rural communities because at the time, um, more than a third of rural communities lacked a prescriber who could prescribe buprenorphine. So how are we going to turn the tide on the opioid epidemic if we don't have prescribers in communities that need it most? So we're making those critical investments, and those are part of the way that we're bringing, again, primary care providers um, into the workforce to support critical behavioral health needs. We also, as I mentioned before, we are the home of the National Health Service Corps. The National Health Service Corps is a 50-year-old program that has made historic investments thanks to this president through the American Rescue Plan in, in getting clinicians, incentivizing clinicians to practice in underserved communities. And so we provide loan repayment in return for clinicians practicing in high need communities. As a consequence, today we have 20,000 clinicians practicing in high need communities thanks to the president's work and investment in this. Um, 9,000 of them are mental health and substance use disorder providers. Wow. Um, and that's because there is a dedicated program in our, um, in our National Service Corps to really make sure that we are leading on what is a critical need here. That's wonderful. Um, I want to talk about an intersection of two administration priorities, uh, maternal depression. Um, I know a lot has been written about it, uh, but talk to me, talk to us about how you're taking on uh, the healthcare workforce programs that we discussed uh, about their investments in maternal and child health. And as we grow the behavioral health workforce and respond to the maternal mortality crisis, how HRSA is addressing workforce issues related to maternal depression. Yeah, it is, um, it is heartbreaking and unacceptable to look at our maternal mortality rates. The fact that black and indigenous women die at two to three times the rate of white women in this country um, associated with birth or the year after birth, that's just unacceptable and it has to change. Um, and one of the ways, uh, we, are, we are the home of the Title V Maternal and Child Health Block Grant. We, by that I mean we give states resources to be able to support newborn screening, to be able to support early intervention services. Um, but this administration has made tackling the maternal mortality crisis a key part of that work. And so we fund an initiative that we're really proud of um, that, um, is called our, that is our maternal depression and screening program where we train OBs and gynecologists, OBGYNs, we train nurse midwives, um, we train others involved in maternal health care in mental health and substance use disorder services. If you talk to um, providers who provide primary care, or provide OB services, pediatricians, they will, particularly people who have been in the field for a while, they'll say they didn't get a lot of this training in, me in med school. So it's a lot to be able to find time to be able to go to training and participate in training. So we also, through our maternal de depression program, are able to provide teleconsultation services. And we've seen in real time an OB who has someone in their office um, who is, has a mental health issue, a mental health condition, um, be able to call and get direct access to mental health experts. These lines are staffed by psychologists and case management teams and the like, um, and get real-time support to be able to manage that condition. And, in, and I can tell you of case after case where otherwise that, that pregnant woman would have had to go get a referral and try to get into services mm -hmm. somewhere. And this is, makes a huge difference in rural communities um, where, you know, where you know, making an appointment and getting transportation and you know, finding childcare and all the things that make it so hard for people to access services. So it's a program that um, we only have enough resources to be in a handful of states right now. In this fiscal year, we'll expand the number of states we're in, but if the proposed cuts 
that Congress is considering right now were to happen, we would have to roll back that expansion. So um, it's a vital program. Um, we want to see it in more places, in more communities, um, and we need to be able to do that. So uh, the other thing that we do that, that is just, um, we're one year in to our maternal mental health hotline. And this is a space where we are working really hard to create a confidential safe space for pregnant women and their families. It turns out their families call a lot too. Um, to be able to get confidential support from a counselor um, and just have a safe space to ask their questions or raise their concerns or, and get a referral to where they need. So um, the, the, we're really excited about the fact that we got additional resources in the omnibus to expand our outreach efforts on that. The phone number is 833-TLC-MAMA. Uh, um, and so we're really excited about our, what we're gonna do in the year ahead to make sure that all pregnant women know that this opportunity exists. That's great. I love that families feel comfortable calling too. That's wonderful. It, you know, the anecdotes that we hear from the folks who take the counselors who call, who tell us about it is that, you know, sometimes a family member will call and say, I think my, this pregnant individual, my family member um, is going through something. Let me tell you what I'm seeing and tell me how to talk to them and tell me how to get them out. Oh, that's lovely. Um, well, I want to keep us on time. I promise. I could listen, obviously, to Carol Johnson all day, as I'm sure the rest of us could. Uh, but I just want to say thank you so much for being here and for playing a part in this incredibly important issue. Uh, and Carol, to close us out, what can people do? Can you give us one, you know, walking through our own doors, getting you out there? What do you want us to do? Can I give you three? Okay, all fine. Right. <laughs> all right, I'm give you three. What am I going to do? Say no? <laughs> <laughs> one, um, Active listening is so important. I feel like I'm telling this to people who taught me this, right? Um, but active listening is so important. People who are experiencing mental health conditions or in some kind of mental health crisis, you know, that it, it, we need to be listening to be able to support our friends and family through this very difficult time. And support's available, and so being able to connect people um, to the supports that I know the next panel will talk a lot about. Um, it's just such an important part of, of this moment in time, you know, so many people are struggling and being able to listen to our friends and family and be that support for them. Two, um, to the extent there are young people in your life or mid-career people or others who are thinking about how to, you know, a lot of people are making new decisions in their lives um, after the pandemic, encouraging people to uh, become mental health and substance use providers, people with lived experience, to become peer support specialists, to um, join our programs to get connected to HRSA.gov and all the ways that we help people get trained to be licensed clinical social workers, to get on a career ladder, to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, the, the field needs you, um, and we strongly encourage people to, to come join us in this work. And then the third thing I would say is, um, again, this is what I learned from this community, we have to take care of ourselves too, take care of our own mental health, um, and make sure that we are doing all the things at this time when you know the, the crisis is so urgent and everyone is working so hard to make sure everyone else gets the supports and services they need that everyone also takes care of themselves as well. well. I can't think of a better way to wrap a conversation on workforce and mental health than with that message. I hope everyone here is taking care of themselves so they can stay in this fight in their own way. Thank you, Carol Johnson. Thank you all for being here. Hope to see everyone again soon. Thanks, Angela. Wow, what a wonderful conversation. Thank you both so much. Now, as Administrator Johnson mentioned, of course, workforce is fundamental and necessary to providing behavioral health care, but we also know that it's often not enough. Um, people face other challenges walking through those doors, um, even where we have clinicians available to treat them. We often hear about people finding the cost of mental health care too high, wait times to see a provider too long, and also stigma being a key barrier to seeking care. 
Our next panel discussion is going to dig into all of these issues and describe the work that we're doing at HHS and also at the White House to help advance the second pillar of the President's National Mental Health Strategy, connecting people to the care that they need. This is truly an all-star panel. Um, we are so excited to welcome to the stage the uh, SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Assistant Secretary, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, the Administrator of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Chiquita brooks Lisher, and the Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy Director of the Domestic Policy Council, Kristen Link-Young. And then this panel is going to be moderated by the fantastic Acting Administrator and Assistant Secretary for Aging, Allison Barkoff. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, and thanks so much, Tisa, for the introduction of our panel. And I wanna welcome everyone in the audience and those watching on the live stream to the Connecting People to Care panel. We have a really, really great panel with people with lots of knowledge and importantly, dedication. And you will be hearing about how the broader administration and HHS are working to improve access to behavioral health care. At its core, we're working to make sure that everyone can get the supports and services that they need. And you'll hear about our all of government holistic approach. That means ensuring people get the supports and services that meet diverse needs of different types of people, whether we're talking about children and youth, or older adults, or people with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders, people who are socially isolated, or people with co-occurring mental health needs and disabilities. And as you'll also hear, it means that we need to address the unique barriers that people in different communities have whether we're talking about communities of color or rural communities or communities where people don't speak English as a first language. So today you will hear that we are using every single program and every single tool in our toolbox. And with that, I'm gonna start with a first question to each of the panelists. During the President's first State of the Union address, he announced a four-part unity agenda focused on areas where members of both parties can come together and make progress for the American people. Mental health is one of those areas. Today we're talking about mental health more than ever before. How has the landscape around mental health awareness and access to care in this country changed in the last few years? Miriam, we'll start with you. Well, thank you for that question, and, and just want to say good morning to everyone, and you know, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, w when I think about the landscape, I mean, we definitely are seeing changes. Um, for one, I mean, it's wonderful that we're having conversations about mental health. Um, we know that that is so important because it helps to break down stigma, uh, helps to promote acceptance, uh, and so that conversation is just so critical and helps people to feel like they're not alone as well. Um, you know, in terms of uh, you know, SAMHSA. Um, I so appreciate that the president and this administration is prioritizing mental health uh, and focused on sort of improving the overall mental health of the nation. Um, how that has translated for us is we've seen unprecedented resources uh, where we've been able to uh, really focus in on a range of areas. Um, so for example, things like enhancing access to, to uh, suicide prevention and crisis care services uh, or enhancing children and youth behavioral health. Um, or working to address the overdose epidemic. All of these areas, uh, among others, are priorities for SAMHSA. Um, we've also been able to expand, for example, the CCBHCs, so our Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. Um, and that is a wonderful clinic that offers 24-hour access and support to services, uh, wraparound services and supports, uh, really geared towards helping people to get connected and creating no wrong door entry into services. Um, one last uh, investment I'll mention is our 988. So transition to the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Um, you know, about $1 billion investment there uh, from the administration. And that has been just life-changing, life-changing for many people in terms of being able to um, have a line that's available when people are struggling. Uh, people can call, text, or chat, get connected to compassionate counselors who are able to meet them where they're at uh, and ultimately get them connected to services and supports. 
Um, so, so it's a unique uh, moment in the, you know, our history in terms of mental health and so appreciate just the focus across the administration uh, around enhancing mental health uh, across the country. I will just add, you know, I think it's worth just really taking a moment about where we are as a country and just how acute a crisis we do have in mental health and behavioral health uh, needs. I think that uh, for a number of reasons that true, is true. It was true before COVID, but over the last couple of years, we've seen tremendous increases. And I would say in, in mental health and substance abuse, behavioral health issues, and very acutely at, I would say, our young end and our older end. So the complexity in talking with people who are in long-term care services and just talking about how people who are older have much more complex mental and substance abuse issues than, say, a decade ago. It's really acute in affecting health overall. And then particularly for our children, um, I was reflecting before we uh, got on with NAMI, uh, uh, our, who we will hear from in a minute, of just talking about for children just what a challenge this period of time has been for so many kids. And then when you think about communities that are underserved, communities of color, rural areas, even more acutely over the last few years. And that's not even to touch on, of course, um, what we've seen in terms of substance abuse uh, at, at throughout the, the spectrum of age. And so I, um, I think there's just tremendous effort from the administration and from Congress to address the needs of um, of the American people and know that all of you are very much engaged in that work. Um, this year, last year, was some of the most consequential mental health uh, legislation that we've seen in a generation. Um, and we're hard at work, uh, certainly with SAMHSA and our partners across the administration in really trying to make sure that we increase access to services, make sure that people can get the care um, care that they need on, on really a spectrum of things. One of the things that um, we have in the legislation, uh, the American Rescue Plan, uh, that is just one of many of the things that I am really excited about are the mobile health crisis units where, and I got to go to Oregon and see, um, just see that happening on the ground where the police are working with mental health um, uh, 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 providers and the local mayor and officials to really make sure that we're getting care where people need in the most appropriate setting, so in the community rather than um, through the justice system. And that's just one example of, I think, the tremendous effort um, that we're putting in as an administration to partner with so many um, other organizations to think about how do we deliver care in the most appropriate way. And I will echo my colleagues. This is a story that very much predates the pandemic, but the fissures of the pandemic era really exposed our challenges in a way that stakeholders across society can see and identify. And so at this moment, I think not only are we seeing conversations about mental health in more places than ever before, but we are seeing broadly the same conversation. Stakeholders are identifying the problem in similar ways. They are reaching for the same types of solutions. And that has enabled incredibly productive legislation, really interesting and impactful work in state capitals and in local government, in health system boardrooms, in the criminal justice system. Stakeholders across society really focusing on this, this problem in ways that allow them to be in conversation with each other and, and leverage solutions uh, that, that are bringing the whole of government and the whole of society together. Thank you. This next question is to Assistant Secretary Delphine Rittman. As Secretary Becerra mentioned in his opening remarks, HHS launched findsupport.gov this month. Could you tell us a little more about this resource and how it can help connect people to care? Yeah, absolutely. So we are you know, just absolutely thrilled to be able to launch Find Support uh, this week. And so what it is, is it is a resource where people can, uh, you know, can uh, go to the website and get just a broad range of information about ways to navigate uh, connecting with mental health services. 
Um, it's really designed for people early in the decision-making process around accessing care. Um, it includes Q and A, so questions and answers around sort of what to look for, um, how to navigate uh, healthcare systems, information about insurance status, even in information about different types of care that a person might have questions about, um, information about uh, different mental health, uh, substance use in terms of either uh, drugs or alcohol. It's really just a wonderful one-stop shop that's geared towards connecting people early in the, in the process uh, who are beginning to think about accessing care uh, to connect them to services and supports. Um, so I encourage folks, you know, check it out, go to the website, let's, let folks know about it, go to our social media, uh, this is gonna be a shameless plug here, <laughs> our social media, um, help us share it, you know, far and wide. Um, because what the data shows us, and you know, we did some, some marketing research re related to need, and um, people were looking for just reliable information about how to connect with care, um, how to get connected to services and supports. And um, we know with the increases in anxiety and depression that we've seen among young people and just some of the increases in both mental health and substance use challenges, the need is there. Um, the need is there. So findsupport.gov is, again, just a wonderful one-stop one shop. Um, it's yet another example of the you know, Biden-Harris administration real focus on you know, helping people get connected to needed services and supports. Um, and the thing that I love about it, again, is, is it's just a wealth of information um, and also includes actually person examples. Um, so examples of how people sort of navigated uh, services and supports or questions that they had as they were thinking about connecting to supports. Um, so we're excited about launching it and, and just thrilled to be at this, this point and appreciate the collaboration really across HHS to help us get to this point. So thank you. The next question is for our administrator of CMS. Um, CMS released a behavioral health strategy early in your tenure and anyone who has worked with you knows that you are about translating vision into action. So can you share with us a little bit about some of the impactful work that you've done across what you call the three M's? I love to talk about the three M's, Medicare, Medicaid and CHIP, and marketplace coverage. And you know, we're now at 170 million Americans who are covered under those three programs. Um, and so there's been just tremendous effort in making sure that people have access to behavioral health um, and mental health services. A couple of the things that I would love to highlight are, I talked about the mobile crisis units, um, but that's just one thing that we are doing in the Medicaid program. And if you saw last week, we released our Medicaid access and managed care rules, where we're, which are proposed and we welcome comments. Um, we're very focused on making sure that people have access to behavioral health and mental health services, and that includes making sure we are holding plans accountable um, for their networks and wait times. And so that has been, I think, one of our strong steps to say we want to make sure that the services that are provided under the Medicaid program really uh, get to Medicaid enrollees. And then last year, as I mentioned, was a huge year for Congress um, to pass mental health um, services uh, and expand services. And in the Medicare program, which already covered many mental health services, of course, um, we've been able to add additional providers, which I think is really in going to be impactful for um, the Medicare program. I like to say that if anyone who's married um, needs a marriage therapist at some point. So I am very excited The Medicare, uh, my husband probably knows that I've said that many times, so. <laughs> but um, I'm really excited that the Medicare program is going to be carried, um, covered um, uh, marriage uh, and family therapists in the program, as well as, again, making sure that uh, people get access to the care that they need. This, this next question is for Kristen. Um, earlier this year, the Domestic Policy Council was really critical in setting the direction of our shared mental health strategy, and we're about a year after the President's call to action. Um, picking up really on a term that you use that we've all really embraced, this whole-of-government approach, can you talk a little more about the President's role and the White House's role in this all-of-government approach? Absolutely, and, and thanks for that question. The, the president's mental health strategy is anchored around three key 
pillars. First is workforce and system capacity. For every type of behavioral health profession and setting and type of service, we need more of it, we need it to be more diverse, and we need it to be in more places. And so we are thinking about using levers across the federal government to, to build that capacity and, and build our workforce. Second, we're focused on breaking down barriers to care, whether it's cost or stigma or, or simply inconvenience. There are things that get in the way of people accessing care and we, we need to take steps to sweep those obstacles away and make it easier for people to access the services they need. And, and third, we need to promote environments that strengthen mental health and support wellness and resilience, whether it's our social safety net, our schools, our prisons, the experiences that people have online, our workplaces. We need to think about integrating mental health, resilience, and wellness into services and, and, and structures across the continuum. And we have seen just such excitement and interest and commitment really across the federal government and taking action in, in really all of those areas. If you think about the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defense, um, they, they run big health systems. They deliver healthcare services to a lot of people. And we have been having such interesting and, and valuable conversations with them about creative things that they can do in the workforce space. So we see DOD supporting a new, new, online, new, new training programs and new um, you know, building up our pipeline of, of workers using a variety of technologies and tools. Um, at VA, you see really just incredibly exciting investments in peer support um, and thinking about sort of a, you know, a big institution doing peer support and, and attempting to do it at scale and, and using peers to support their very unique population and the mental health needs of, of veterans. Uh, at the Department of Education, uh, we see really a, a tremendous partner to the work that is happening at HHS around supporting school-based mental health services. Uh, you know, young people today uh, really have, have borne the brunt of many of the challenges of, of the COVID era, um, but they also have a different relationship to mental health than, than older generations. And so creating a predictable system of school-based mental health services, I think, is a, is a tremendous opportunity in this policy moment to, to change the way a whole generation of people interact with mental health services and supports um, throughout, their, throughout their lives. The Department of Labor is thinking about how they can support workplaces and have released toolkits and a variety of resources about how employers can do better at supporting mental health needs of their workers. And then on the other side of, of, the, of the street, you have the EEOC really thinking about all of these issues through a discrimination lens and, uh, and, and releasing resources about, about disability discrimination in the context of mental health. So, so just really tremendously exciting work happening across the federal government on, on all of these issues. My next question is for Assistant Secretary Delphin Rittman. Um, we are in about two months going to be hitting the one year anniversary of the 988 suicide and crisis line. And that has been a big game changer. What have you learned during the first year? And what are some of the things you hope to achieve in year two? No, thank you. Thanks for that question. And and you know, I, I have to say, just, just here alone, there are many of the partners that we worked on to be able to get to where we are with the you know, transition to 988. Um, so, so you know, one thing that I've learned is just that our, and not even that I've learned, but, but it's been an exciting part of this work, um, is that you know, to get where we are has taken the village, uh, and uh, to get where we need to go, we'll continue to take the village. Uh, and so I'm excited about that. It means sort of ongoing partnerships uh, across the federal, state, and local level. Um, as folks know, the 988 network is, is designed, uh, it, it's made up of 200 crisis call centers across the country, in addition to about uh, 14 or so backup centers. Uh, and so, you know, certainly moving forward, a goal is to continue to strengthen both the call centers themselves, um, as well as to continue to build out the rest of the, the crisis care continuum. Um, ultimately, our, you know, our, our goal is that you know, when a person reaches out, they have someone to talk to, someone to respond, and a safe place to go. Um, and that is really just a critical part of the vision. Um, I do have to say, you know, just again, so appreciative of the focus uh, on this initiative and transition to the 988 Lifeline. The administration has put forward about $1 billion. Uh, and so that is a significant investment, really, that has helped us to get here. Um, what we've seen is so far since, the, since July, about 3.2 million people 
uh, have reached out to get connected to either calls, texts, or chats. Uh, so it has been a, a, a real valuable resource for folks. Um, in terms of some of the things we're working on and looking at moving forward, I mean, we're, we're continuing to develop a number of sub-networks. So, you know, we know it's important to um, meet people where they're at. So there is a Spanish sub-network for individuals that are Spanish-speaking. We're looking to continue to build that out and to offer Spanish chat and text. Um, there's also an LGBTQ uh, sub-network that we're continuing to, to build out and excited about that. Um, we're also working with the Ad Council and the Suicide Prevention Resource Center um, and doing, doing real targeted marketing research because we want 988 to be for everybody. It is for everybody. And so our messaging um, is really going to be critical there to target um, under-resourced and underserved or at-risk groups. And so we're working with the Ad Council um, to be able to develop some of that specific messaging so that um, we can reach communities that may not currently be accessing or not, may not be aware of 988. So we're excited about that initiative. Um, and so that's just some of the work. You know, we're also looking forward, um, you know, planning to offer uh, services and supports uh, for uh, individuals that are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, and that's such an important population in terms of ensuring that they have access to needed services and supports. Uh, so so it's, a, it's an ongoing, it's ongoing work. And, you know, certainly continuing to build out things like CCBHCs. Um, that's important because we need to be able to connect folks to safe, uh, you know, community-based services and supports. And, and we know CCBHCs are a wonderful companion model there uh, because, again, offers 24-hour wraparound services and supports. Um, so those are just some of the things that, that we have in place related to, to 988. It's just, it's making a difference. And I'll, I'll quickly share just one, one quick antidote that I heard or recently that has just been so powerful and has really stayed with me. Um, you know, I heard about this one instance where a, a person you know, she Googled how to, how to harm myself painlessly or, or how to kill myself painlessly. Uh, and, you know, what she got was the 988 number. Um, and so she called 988 and she was able to connect with somebody and she, you know, was able to get the support that she needed. And she told the worker, you know, I'm, I'm glad I didn't get what I was looking for uh, because uh, I, I got what I needed. You know, I got what I needed in, in connecting with the counselor. So. We're continuing to hear stories like that, and we know that it's making a difference. And so just, just grateful for um, the resources uh, from the Biden-Harris administration, for our partnerships. Uh, again, with men, many of you here, uh, they're with us today, uh, and, and just looking forward to continue to take it to the next level. So. Wow, what a powerful story about what we're trying to achieve, about helping people get the support they need. I want to jump off a comment that you made and ask our other two panelists. You really were at your core talking about something that's so important to the president, the administration, our secretary, which is the all means all in the work that we do and how to really with intentionality reach underserved communities. And thank you for sharing everything you're doing um, in that work. I'd like to ask the administrator to, to share some of the work that you're doing around equity and reaching underserved communities and then the same question for Kristen. Sure, and I, let me join by saying what a powerful story um, that, that you shared and how important it is to, for us to really make sure that we are connecting to people in need in the most appropriate way. And I would say we have these tremendous opportunities now to continue to make sure as we build out to make sure that services are available so that people can get the care they, they need, that it really is done in a way where people are connecting in a culturally appropriate way, that they are engaging with someone who is able to uh, understand where they're coming from and deliver the care. And some of how we're doing that is through some of our waivers. So we have state initiatives um, where states are really thinking about how do they partner at the local level with um, different types of providers and broadening the, um, uh, broadening who is participating, which I think is incredibly important, and also often making sure you're 
dealing with other issues like social determinants of health that are all related to making sure that people are getting the care that they need. And I would just finally say, as we continue to integrate mental health and behavioral health into physical health, they're all related. And how do we continue to make sure that when people are getting care, whether it's through managed care, whether it's through accountable care organizations, whether it's through other initiatives, that we're not looking at one part of the body that we are looking holistically about what does this person need and I think that that is very much part of the work that we need to do to make sure that we address mental um, and substance abuse issues. And, and I would just add, you know, the president is deeply committed to equity in, in all of the work that the, the White House is doing, and that, that manifests in a lot of ways in the, the way we think about mental health and the, the challenges that communities face. Um, I want to, in particular, highlight diversity in the, the pipeline of, of workers um, and the importance of helping um, as, we, as we address a, a critical workforce shortage in behavioral health, um, helping people find culturally competent providers and finding providers who can speak to their experiences um, and, and come from their communities. And so we are, we are thinking about, uh, about creative ways to, to bring communities into these professions uh, and to support people from all walks of life in, uh, in establishing a vocation in mental health. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one audience question. Oh, I see someone who put their hand up first. Hi, um, I'm uh, Dr. Farah Abbasi, I'm a psychiatrist. So this uh, is my concern, is when we talk about mental health provider shortage, I didn't uh, hear psychiatrists being mentioned. And I'm worried about that, yes, all this is very amazing, encouraging, and we do need, there's a shortage all throughout. So that's my concern that uh, when we talk about burnout and compassionate fatigue, psychiatrists are getting affected too. Um, there is like, I, I'm from Michigan, there are 33 counties without a psychiatrist. And when we go towards specialized, like child or geriatrics, it becomes harder. And psychiatrists are still like, you know, the team uh, captain in a sense. So that's one thing. Other thing I really wanted to talk about is, at this point in our country, we are losing one to two physicians who are completing suicide. That's 365 to 400 providers, physicians losing their life to suicide. So I just wanted to highlight that. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is huge as a mental health provider. Thank you, and I don't know if we have anyone who wants to jump in quickly on that, and I, I think our last panelist also, uh, uh, Carol Johnson, is really the one in HHS who deals with some of those pipelines. But Yeah, I will, I will just briefly highlight the, the important work um, that, that Congress has undertaken to fund new training slots for psychiatrists, so there are hundreds of new slots uh, for psychiatric training coming out online in the next couple of years, which uh, will, will help move the needle there, uh, th that does not take the place of supporting our existing workforce and recognizing the challenges of, of recent years and, um, and meeting people where they are and ensuring that this workforce is fully supported. And I'll just, oh sorry, um, and, and please do. I do absolutely want to acknowledge that the uh, burnout of the workforce, the healthcare workforce, and particularly mental health providers, the entire range, is very top of mind for the administration. This is one of the Surgeon General's primary areas of focus of really um, just engaging and thinking about what can we do and I'll just say from the CMS perspective knowing that across the administration we're thinking about it part of our lever is just thinking about how can we help to make being a provider easier in terms of burdens and that's one of the lenses that we are thinking about in addition to all the other things we're discussing yeah, and, and I'll just add real quickly so the you know the Surgeon General put out a guide recently that is so helpful it's the workplace wellness uh, guide and it talks about sort of eight dimensions of, of sort of workplace wellness and, and I think the resources in that are, are just so valuable. Um, the other thing I'll share is that you know at SAMHSA we offer the Minority Fellowship Program um, and so that 
Oh, wonderful, wonderful. I'm a fellow too. I'm a fellow, and, and uh, it, you know, it's just a fantastic program in terms of supporting psychiatry, psychology, marriage and family therapy, um, substance use uh, professions, just across the board, behavioral health. Um, and so that's something we're, we're grateful for, additional resources to continue to expand that. Uh, and and it's, we know it's career changing uh, for folks. We added one piece to it that, that uh, individuals uh, continue to, for each year they were funded, um, continue to, to um, offer, uh, to, to work in a site that uh, is diverse. Um, and often we know that people stay at the places where they do their uh, internships or their payback agreements. Um, and, and I'm ex an example of that as well. I, I stayed on for, uh, you know, almost 20 years at, at, at EL where I did my payback agreement. Um, so it's a wonderful program and just so thrilled that the administration and, and um, President Biden as part of the mental health uh, strategy has continued to expand that program. And I just want to say thank you to my colleagues on the stage with me and, and really all of you who are here today working together towards our goal to make care more accessible and to help people get what they need when they need it. So thank you. I want to thank our panelists for that really incredible discussion. The most important voices in shaping mental health policy are the people we have the privilege of serving. And so at HHS, it's a priority for us to listen to, lift up, and amplify the experiences of people who have themselves experienced mental health challenges and also their families and their caregivers. So I'm so grateful that a member of our HHS family is here to share her story today. It's an honor to welcome Liz Sweet from SAMHSA's Office of Recovery. Good morning, everyone. I have, um, you have already met our SAMHSA uh, Assistant Secretary Miriam on the previous panel, and she uh, has identified for all of us at SAMHSA this year as the year of hope. And I would like to share greetings from SAMHSA's Office of Recovery and our Director Paolo Del Vecchio. I am a woman with a diagnosis of clinical depression and the mother of a son with mental health challenges. I would like to open my remarks this morning with a poem entitled, Welcome to Holland by Emily Pearl Kingsley. I am often asked to describe the experience of raising a child with a disability to help people who have not shared that unique experience to understand it and to imagine how it would feel. It's like this. When you're going to have a baby, it's like planning a fabulous vacation in Italy. You buy guidebooks and you make wonderful plans. The Colosseum, Michael's, Michelangelo's David, the gondolas in Venice. You may even learn some handy phrases in Italian. It's all very exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives, you pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the plane lands and the stewardess says, welcome to Holland. Holland? What do you mean Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life, I've dreamed of Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. You've landed in Holland, and there you must stay. The important thing is, they haven't taken you to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of pestilence, famine, and disease. It's just a different place. So now you must go and buy new guidebooks 
You must learn a whole new language. And you will meet a whole new group of people you would never have otherwise met. It's just a different place. It's slower paced than Italy and less flashy than Italy. But after you've been there for a while, you catch your breath, you look around, and you begin to notice Holland has windmills. Holland has tulips. Holland even has Rembrandts. Everyone you know is busy coming and going from Italy, and they're all bragging about what a wonderful time they had while they were there. For the rest of your life, you will say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go. That's what I had planned. The pain of that will never, ever, ever go away because the loss of that dream is a very significant loss. But if you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't get to go to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special, the very lovely things about Holland. So now, I want to introduce you to my tour guide to Holland. This is my husband and my son, TJ, who would have been 43 years old this year. TJ was diagnosed with ADHD at age two after being seen by a child neurologist for a possible sleep disorder. The diagnosis was further confirmed after he got out of his crib during one night and could be heard having a tantrum, and I mean a tantrum, but we couldn't find him. After several frantic minutes of looking for him, we found him in our backyard upset because he couldn't get the gate on the fence open to get out. In talking with the neurologist about how to keep him safe, we were advised to lock the door on his bedroom at night from the outside. This was the beginning of our family's journey into isolation and lack of support. My husband was a teacher. I was a social worker, licensed professional counselor, and a licensed drug and alcohol counselor. Both of us, our professional friends, and us were mandated reporters. We no longer invited our friends to our home because there was no way to explain the need to lock your two-year-old son in his room at night. Both our families started inviting us to fewer family functions because there was no way to predict <clears throat> what direction TJ's energy for the day would take us and what might get broken in the process. Our church was no longer an inviting community. The looks of annoyance that we were given when his lack of attentiveness got in the way of their being able to enjoy the service made it clear we were no longer welcome. This meant that either my husband or I were going to have to stay home while the other attended church with our two daughters. No longer able to have friends over to our home, enjoy time with our extended family, or attend Sunday worship services, we were left isolated from the very people we should have been able to reach out to for support. We were then asked not to bring our son back to preschool where he was attending and we couldn't find another preschool for him. When TJ started kindergarten, I needed to advocate for services and an individualized education plan for him in our neighborhood school <clears throat> and advocate I did to the point that my husband was visited in his classroom by his department chair and was asked the question, do you like your job? My husband shared he did and was then told, then you better get your wife to back off. My husband's response was, obviously you don't know my wife. This experience further pushed us into isolation and I began having suicidal and homicidal ideations. My plan was to put myself and our son 
in our car in the garage, turn the car on, and lift the burden from my husband's shoulders and allow our daughters to have a normal childhood without the pressures of dealing with their brother's behavior. Obviously, I didn't follow through with the plan, but I was sinking further and further into depression and not being able to provide for our son's needs. <clears throat> we were able to get him some of the services he needed at school, and with the help of the Vietnam Agent Orange lawsuit and their fund, we were able to get him some adaptive equipment that he was able to use. My husband is a Vietnam veteran who served in Vietnam from 68 to 69 and was sprayed with Agent Orange. Our three biological children all have disabilities attributed to his exposure to Agent Orange, and TJ's was ADHD. TJ made it through school. By going to summer school each year, he was able to graduate a semester early and enlist in the Army. My husband and I were not excited about his choice, but he was determined. He left for basic training and loved it. He flourished in basic training and felt like he had found where he belonged. He served for five years and was deployed to Iraq in September of 2003. He celebrated his 23rd birthday in October and November 27th of 2003 on Thanksgiving Day, he died as a result of suicide. I share all of this with you because I want you to know that as you drive down the street you live on, or walk down the hallway of the apartment building you live in, or walk past the office doors or cubicles where you work, you have no idea what the people behind those doors or in those cubicles might be going through and how isolated they may be feeling, even though they have a smile on their face that hides what's happening in their life. At SAMHSA, we had a campaign a few years back called What a Difference a Friend Makes. During this month of May, I hope you reach out and check on your friends and see how they are doing. I want to tell you about three of my friends. One, Pat Baker, who is a peer specialist. The moment that I called and said, Pat, TJ has died, she said, I'll be right there. She flew across the country to come and hold my hand and hold my heart. The second person I want to tell you about is Connie Wells. Had it not been for Connie, the previous picture that you saw would not have been possible. And that picture is the last kiss I got from my son before he boarded the bus to the airport. My third friend is Carlotta McCleary. All of these women I have known for over 35 years. Carlotta is really that friend who, when I was coming back from travel, I would locked myself out of my house. And 12.30 at night, I picked up the phone and I said, Carlotta, can I come and sleep at your house? She said, absolutely. Those are the kinds of friends that I hope each and every one of you have. After our son's death, I became clinically depressed again, and with the help of a wonderful psychiatrist and a support organization for families of military members who have lost their lives called TAPS, the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, I've been able to find people who are walking the same journey I am, and through peer-to-peer -peer support, my life is again filled with hope. I hope that any of you or a family member who find yourself struggling with a mental health challenge or in a mental health crisis, please use SAMHSA's 988 crisis line. Um, you, may, you can access 988 24-7 and it provides access for you to train crisis counselors who help people experiencing mental health related distress and can be accessed by anyone, either by texting or by chatting. If you or your family 
members are dealing with substance abuse challenges, please use SAMHSA's treatment locator to find help in your area. I also want to reinforce um, what the secretary this morning said uh, about the new program that is being launched and rolled out about findsupport.gov. It's a new user-friendly website which is designed for the public and will help people identify resources and find a way to pay for treatment. I want you to know you are not alone. There is hope and I hope you reach out to a friend. Welcome to Holland. Thank you so much, Liz, for sharing your journey and your story with us. From the incredible pain uh, and loss, unimaginable loss, that Liz has endured, it is incredible and inspiring to see the love, the service, the commitment to supporting others facing similar challenges that has come out of that. Thank you so much. You are an inspiration and a true north to us all. It's an honor to be able to welcome our next speaker, who has also been a true leader in addressing mental health and substance use issues, but in the halls of Congress. Our next speaker will be Congressman David Trone, the co-founder and co-chair of the Bipartisan Addiction and Mental Health Task Force in the U.S. House of Representatives. Please join me in welcoming him. Good morning, everybody. Well, first of all, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here to speak today uh, during Mental Health Month. And thank you to our panelists. I mean, this next panel coming up, you got a great group of folks. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion. And all of us who are here today were driven by our experiences that are often personal in mental health, as it is for us and my family, but we're also here because it's so many of our loved ones have suffered and struggled in the mental health area. So we're united and it's personal to all of us. I lost a nephew, he was 24. Uh, he died of a fentanyl overdose uh, in 2016. And you know, as most of you all know, we've lost over a million Americans, 100,000 each of the last two years. 80% is now fentanyl. And this is sweeping the country and it's a very, very difficult uh, disease to beat but a disease it is, and it's connected so much with mental health and depression. And my nephew certainly suffered in that area, and we can't fix one thing without fixing everything together. It's got to all move together. So the question is, you know, what is Congress doing? Uh, as was mentioned, uh, when I got to Congress, I focused on three major issues, and addiction, mental health, and what I believe is a systemically racist criminal justice system that we have to do better. I mean, shame on us when we have one in three young black men go to jail. Shame on us. That's on us. So I started and founded a freshman working group. I got 65 freshmen all on my team. Then when I got to my second term, I expanded. I've got now 140 members in our bipartisan mental health and substance use disorder task force. Two issues. We got over 100 bills last year we put out. 26 of those bills we got to the finish line, signed by the president. Every bill has to be bipartisan. 
while I'm a very progressive Democrat, I realize we have got to work together. We've got to work as a team, as what I call Team America, or we got no shot. We got no shot of making true change in the areas that so desperately need it. The areas where folks in mental health and substance use and those incarcerated have no voice. They don't have a voice. So we passed bills like the Cops Counseling Bill. Cops Counseling gave policemen confidential peer-to-peer -peer counseling. I lost a policeman in Montgomery County, Maryland here to a suicide. We passed a Public Safety Office Officer Support Bill. When Officer Bomba took his life because of on-the-job PTSD, his wife got zero, no benefits, because we didn't treat mental health as if you died in the line of duty for physical health. That bill passed unanimously in the Senate, bipartisan everywhere. And now those folks will have benefits all across our country. We did community project funding all over our district. That's a key area. We can really drive mental health progress in our districts. And, but when I get asked all the time, what's key to do? It's about stop the stigma. COVID-19 has just made it so much worse. Uh, we all know that. One in five adults in America are living with mental illness. Suicide, 50,000 people every year. Second leading cause of death for children and adolescents, young adults. It's unacceptable. As people in this room know, we've got to teach everyone to say it's okay not to be okay. We've got to get comfortable saying I'm not okay so we can stop this stigma. According to NAMI, and we have the NAMI folks here next, the average delay in treatment is 11 years. That's pretty hard to believe. Could you imagine if someone had cancer, and I had cancer, and I'm a survivor, if someone had cancer and we waited 11 years for treatment, someone had diabetes and we waited 11 years for treatment, Thank God we have folks like Senator Fetterman who stood up and said, I need help. And it's important we acknowledge that people from every demographic there is, every walk of life, we're all impacted. It's not white and black, Republican, Democrat, it's all of us. It's everywhere. And in order to get the biggest impact, we must meet folks where they are. So last year, Congress passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. You're all very familiar with it. It's really a mental health bill. They call it a gun bill. And $11 billion, unbelievable amount of dollars, $3 billion just to schools. So in addition to that, we passed the Restoring Hope for Mental Health and Well-Being Act. Had 30 bills in it, passed the last day of Congress. 30 bills, over half of those were from our task force, right from our group. It passed 402 to 20. Talk about bipartisanship. That's what that was. In the 118th Congress, we'll be reintroducing the resolution to recognize mental health as our, nation, our nation's, head, nation's teachers, because our teachers have really struggled also. We worked on three billion for students, but we can't forget our teachers. These folks have dedicated their lives to the next generation. They don't get the salaries, they don't get the resources, and they're also not getting that emotional support. We'll also be reintroducing the Higher Education and Mental Health Act, which would help establish a national commission to examine the current policies that help students, students, achievement, and help the quality of services that students get. My foundation wrote a check for $10 million to my alma mater to work on student mental health there at Furman University. We want to serve as a model. But the Biden administration and the Secretary Becerra, they have been strong. They have been the best partners. This administration has done more for mental health and addiction than all the previous administrations combined. And we should be proud of the part that we've played. And as President Biden said in his unity agenda, 
the most important two things in the State of the Union. Two items. One, addiction. Two, mental health. Every time I see the President, and we just saw him last Friday night at our DNC event, talk about two things, mental health, addiction, and he really gets it. He gets it, he cares, and he's put his money where his care is, and now we've got to get that money out to the, out to the United States to spend it because we've done all these great things, chips and science, inflation reduction, but now we got to spend the money and we got to make a change. So thank you for being here. Thanks for being part of this crusade because it's a lot of work to do and thank you for your help. Thank you so much, Congressman Trone, for sharing those remarks with us. Now, truly transforming mental health in the U.S. requires more than just the health care system. We also have to address many of the community stressors and social and economic factors that influence the prevalence of mental health conditions and also how easy the path to recovery is. This includes education, it includes housing, it includes employers, it includes all of us. Through its focus on finding support and creating healthy environments, the President's national strategy to address our mental health crisis envisions a whole of society approach. Our next panel is going to discuss how we realize that bold vision. We'll be hearing from the Deputy Director of the Indian Health Service, Benjamin Scott, Assistant Secretary Taryn Williams, who leads the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor, Joseph Getch, the CEO of PRS, and Daniel Gillison, Jr., the CEO of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. And so sorry, um, uh, last but certainly not least, our moderator will be the wonderful Assistant Secretary of the Administration on Children and Families, January Contreras. Thanks so much, and thanks to con the Congressman for that, those wonderful and very compelling remarks. So this panel, um, I'm very honored to be with colleagues who are doing such important work across the country. Um, this is finding support and creating community. And the focus here is how behavioral health is integrated into community. And how are we building equity? How are we building that pipeline of services and accessibility to services that are culturally relevant, that are linguistically appropriate and adequate for the communities that we serve? And we're gonna talk about prevention and the importance of destigmatizing mental health issues. I have the wonderful privilege of serving as the administration for Children and Families Assistant Secretary of January Contreras. We span everything from Head Start and child care to child welfare to refugee resettlement. Very broad mission, and we're working very hard to build mental health supports into all of our work. We're here today along with partners from across the U.S. government, from HHS, uh, answering a call to action from President Biden and Secretary Becerra. And we have made significant investments, as we just heard, so I won't touch on that. We know that in this work, we don't solve challenges on our own, though. The HHS is committed, and you can see it in all that we do, but that the solving of challenges doesn't happen by any one entity. It takes community. So we do want to share um, that we're working very hard to, in our space, children and youth, to engage those um, young people themselves, to engage providers who work every day with kids, to engage with parents. Um, and in that work, uh, as you heard this morning, the HHS Children and Youth Resilience Challenge was launched. as something I hope you take back. I hope you um, encourage your own communities to be a part of. We know that for many, it's cultural, it's family traditions that build resiliency. 
that help people get through very tough times. Uh, and we want those ideas. We want you to be submitting those, and we want them from every corner of the country uh, to come in. So we have a fantastic panel, each bring a very different perspective on creating community and integrating behavioral health care. And I'm looking forward to hearing from them. So let's start. My first question is for Deputy Director Smith. So an important pillar of the Biden-Harris administration's effort to expand access to mental health care is to make it easier to find care where people are, in schools, in community centers, in places of work and worship. And at ACF, we have sought to do just that through ours. Can you tell us more about what you see, that work being done um, to reach people? Yes, th thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Contreras. Again, my name is Ben Smith. I'm the Deputy Director of the Indian Health Service. I'm also a member of the Navajo Nation. So this question really uh, means a lot to me. Um, at the Indian Health Service, uh, we have a noble mission, which is to raise the physical, mental, social, and spiritual health of American Indians and Alaska Natives to the highest level. And when you think about the fact that there are 574 federally recognized tribes, independent and individual governments, this can become quite a challenging task as we look to addressing some of the highest statistics around suicide, alcohol-related deaths, and behavioral health disparities impacting this population in particular. And our means to develop a system of a comprehensive screening and effective intervention to reduce morbidity and early mortality becomes daunting at times. However, what we've found is that we have really embraced the Biden strategy of integrated models of care. In particular, uh, this year, actually last year, we uh, launched a behavioral health integration initiative, which allows for a five-year grant for uh, tribes, tribal organizations, even our federal Indian health system, to really look at strengthening uh, care teams, looking at um, strengthening infrastructure, or enhancing the clinical uh, process, uh, such as uh, a focus on uh, depression screenings, to really enhance the work at the local communities. We know that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to this, especially in the diversity that we see across our communities. So our prioritization of the delivery of comprehensive and culturally appropriate health services within this population becomes even more important. Uh, coupled with uh, this effort and other grant programs that are really focusing on suicide prevention, uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, um, we have really taken a targeted focus on our policies, one that focuses around trauma-informed care. You know, I, as a federal employee, I, I, I thought about this for a moment as uh, my father was sharing with me some of his uh, direct experiences as a, a Navajo speaker, native Navajo speaker, who went through the boarding school process. And while I didn't go through that process myself, I was starting to feel something. I, I was traumatized somehow. And um, this is a real uh, thing that plays out in American Indian and Alaska Native communities. So at the Indian Health Service, we have taken an approach to extend this policy to all of our employees, one, to understand the various forms of, uh, of trauma, whether it's historical, whether it's real, um, in line with the, the um, Biden administration right now, we are in, working across the government on the Not Invisible Act Commission that's looking at murdered and missing indigenous persons. Thank, thank you, a very important. But along these lines with, with our policy, understanding trauma and how to respond to it at the community level is taking an all of community approach um, that extends to education, extends to our healthcare and across the board. So in a nutshell, this is really some of the, high, at a high level, uh, some of our approaches that are in play right now as we look at uh, behavioral health integrated initiatives and, um, and to adopt the president's um, strategies for addressing mental health and behavioral health. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'll turn to Assistant Secretary Williams from the Department of Labor. Sure. Um, we know that there was huge impact, uh, burnout, that there was a lot of stress that came through pandemic, um, that it really came through the forefront. And some, we're still seeing that play out in the workplace. Can you talk about the work that the Department of Labor has been doing in this space and how you're working to improve and raise awareness about mental health in the workplace? Sure, and thank you so much for that question. By way of introduction, hello everyone, I'm Taryn Williams. I have the privilege of serving as the Assistant Secretary for Disability Employment Policy uh, and leading the Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP for short, because uh, we love our, our acronyms. And I can say that as an agency, but really, truly as a department, we are incredibly focused on, on mental health right now. And it's not just because it's May. Uh, and it's not just because we have recently seen uh, a new urgency uh, and attention in the crisis that we're confronting, but it's because we know intimately and have known for some time now that mental health has an inextricable link to one's experience in the workplace. Everything from the quality of your job, the workplace culture, your compensation, all of those factors influence the experiences that we have. Uh, and we also know from employers and employees alike that mental health has been at the forefront of their minds for some time. And I know, and I had the opportunity to hear a little bit of the conversation as we were coming on stage, and some of those data are, are incredibly stark. We know that nearly one in five, by some measures, uh, individuals have reported increases in anxiety and depression. We know that whereas in 2019, there were reports of perhaps 11% of individuals uh, reporting that they had experience with anxiety and depression, that that number has skyrocketed to 41%. Uh, it has not escaped us at the Department of Labor or anywhere in this administration that there are communities that are disproportionately impacted by what we've experienced in the last few years. And I'm very careful in how I talk about that because you're right, we are confronting a, a collective trauma. We are, as, as a country, still processing grief, but we also know that the last few years have exacerbated existing inequities that impact, in particular, black and Latino communities. And so at the Department of Labor, we have been and will continue to be grappling with this for some time. Uh, at the start of the month, just a few days ago, we launched our new DOL, DOL Mental Health at Work initiative, which brings to bear all of the resources, the authority, that we have as a department uh, in order to educate workers on their rights, in order to ensure that employers are aware of what they need to do, not just what they need to do, but what they can do to support workers uh, who are grappling with their, their mental health. And perhaps I'll just say one additional piece, because I know we want to get to others in the panel, and that is with our agency in particular. We're not an enforcement agency. We focus on policy. And so many of the, the conversations that we're having today are with private and public sector employers of all kinds and also with policymakers at the state and local levels. I've had the opportunity to meet with legislators all around the country, uh, mayors who are at the forefront of this crisis, and they all say, together that we have a moment in which we can address the stigma and build awareness and ultimately the access to treatment and the unmet needs that we know exist in communities. And that is the, the fight that my colleagues at the Department of Labor and truly throughout the administration, the one that we're having right now. So I'll stop there. Thank you. 
So we'll turn to Daniel Gillison, the NAMI CEO. Uh, Daniel, you have over 30 years of professional experience in mental health advocacy and have worked tirelessly to advance mental health equity. How could equity, how should it factor into how we integrate mental health care into communities? And can you share some promising examples and promising practices of strengthened culturally and linguistically uh, relevant services? Thank you very much. And before I do that, let me just say thank you to, uh, to you for hosting us in terms of uh, moderating this panel. To all of you out there, uh, many of whom I've had the opportunity to interact with, I want to go off script for a second and just say good morning to you. Thank you for the work that you do. And on behalf of NAMI, we just appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with you and with our panelists here. Uh, in terms of uh, who we are, I will not assume that everyone knows who NAMI is, so I'll stop for a second. National Alliance on Mental Illness was started, and the reason I'm doing this is because it was started by moms in Madison, Wisconsin in 1979. Uh, no greater advocate than a mother. And moms started that organization, and it has become, uh, in its 44th year, this organization of over 600 affiliates and over 49 state organizations with over a thousand uh, volunteers across the country that know the DNA in the communities that are doing the work, providing the programming, the support, and the services uh, where needed and when needed. In terms of equity, uh, mental illness uh, it, it doesn't know uh, a, uh, a, a political party. It doesn't know a race. It doesn't know a religion. It doesn't know a sexual orientation. What it knows is mental illness. So what we look to do, and in terms of equity, we want the best for all. And in terms of how that's demonstrated is in that DNA in the communities and the work that we're doing and how we structure that work. And a lot of that work is done as NAMI is a, uh, is a community, it is a uh, collective, and it is a collaborator. So we collaborate with you. Now speaking to what we're doing explicitly in terms of in reaching out to uh, communities of color uh, and, and, and communities that are underserved is we're trying to, you know, we say nothing about us without us. And we say you're not alone. So we're going to the communities and looking to meet them where they are. So we have a program that is for communities of color called Sharing Hope because you have a lot in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the communities where people are feeling helpless and hopeless. And that's a part of their anxiety, that's a part of their depression, that's part of their lived experience and what they already come to the table with. So Sharing Hope is one of our programs. We have another one called Compartiendo Esperanza. And that is a program, both of these are, are, are programs that we're doing in communities of color and this is directly in the communities. The other thing we're doing is outreach to HBCUs um, um, and we're doing that very intentionally uh, because we know that these are our up and coming leaders of the future and we know what the stress points are for young people as they're matriculating through college. So we wanna meet them before uh, we, we move to that, that point where they're trying to get adult services. Uh, we wanna catch them as they're going into uh, their matriculation through college. Uh, we also have created a partnership uh, we want to work with the Divine Nine. Divine Nine are the fraternities and sororities in the, uh, in the uh, black uh, community, and we've signed an MOU with uh, Delta Sigma Theta for the next two years. One of their five platforms is working on mental, mental health. They are an organization with over 1,000 chapters and over 350,000 members. So we want to be very intentional with that work, and, and, and our collaboration is trying to do that. The other thing is the faith-based community. In the faith-based community, we have something called FaithNet, with FaithNet, what we've created is a national um, uh, initiative, Pathways to Hope. Now, you've heard me use that word earlier. It's, it's about hope, and it's about connective tissue. Um, we look at this as creating a tapestry, or if you think about a quilt, there's all these patches that are on this, that, that construct a quilt. But what's the common thing about a quilt? is that thread that goes through it. And we look at that thread of being this patch of all of us right here. So, the Pathways to Hope is our faith-based conference that is for faith-based leaders from all communities. As we know, we talk about helping others. Our faith-based leaders can't help others unless they help themselves. So we want to give them the tools to help others, but we also want to have them get off of that treadmill, and we want to help them. So we have a national conference called Pathways to Hope. So those are just some of the examples of the things that we're doing and the outreach that we're having um, directly with communities of color and, and um, underserved communities. Thank you for that. 
Um, as we go forward, we know that 988 has been a really important initiative, um, and it has really grown, and there's been a lot of investment into an existing system of people who've been doing this work and investing in that system and expanding. Uh, so I'd like to turn to Joseph Ketch, who is the CEO um, of this work. And you know we know 988 does such essential work in providing crisis care services to people in need. Um, can you talk about your work in this space and how do you interact with community on the ground? Thank you for that question. Um, so you touched on a good point, the investment that's gone into 988. So just a little history. Um, PRS has been around for 60 years. This is our 60th anniversary. We're super excited about that. And back in 2014, we were approached by a very small nonprofit in Arlington called Crisis Link. And Crisis Link had a staff of about four people um, and a cadre of volunteers, and they were answering a local crisis line in Northern Virginia. Um, since that time, uh, Crisis Link today, through investment from SAMHSA, uh, our state partners, and, and our local communities, uh, Crisis Link has grown to over 215 uh, staff on that program alone. Um, we are uh, the regional crisis call center in Virginia for four out of the five health planning regions. That's how uh, in, in the state they carve that out. We work very closely with community services boards. Um, and we also are answering uh, 988 in the state of Virginia. So just to give you a sense of, of scale, um, just for Virginia 988, uh, we're answering between 5,000 and 6,000 calls a month. Um, of those calls that are, that are coming in, we're answering nearly 98% of those calls in less than 15 seconds, which is an incredible benchmark compared to where we were. If I think back just three years uh, before we started looking at the investments coming into the state to support 988, uh, the Virginia answer rate was in the low 60%. I meant a lot of people were not getting a counselor on, on the phone. Um, so through that investment, we've been able to get that call answer rate up. Uh, in addition to our work in the state, PRS is also part of the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as a national backup center. Um, not every state like Virginia is blessed to have a very robust um, call center or 988 uh, network. So uh, in those states, when calls are coming in and, and the local call centers are not able to answer that, those are rolling over to about 14 national backup centers across uh, the nation, and PRS is one of those. So. We're, we're, we're glad that we're able to contribute not only in Virginia, but also nationally in that work as well. Um, and the other thing about 988 is it's not just a hotline, right? Different people access um, services in different ways. And one of the things that we know is that younger populations are really coming into the 988 network through text and chat. Um, so PRS is also part of the 988 uh, text and chat center. Uh, we're answering uh, just about 40,000 uh, texts and chats a year as part of that. Um, and, and surprisingly, we only answer that uh, between 8 p.m. and 4.30 a.m., so we're covering one of three shifts um, on chat. Uh, but through um, support from SAMHSA and the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services, we're looking at launching a 24-7, 365 chat service uh, in July in Virginia. Um, and why is that important? Because what we know is that um, being able to respond to calls locally is critically important. Um, so uh, one of the challenges with 988, and I know this is something that's being worked on, uh, is the idea of, of uh, geo-routing. Um, in this area, as we all know, we have a lot of people that live in different, you know, come from different places. So if you are from New York and you live in Virginia and your cell phone is 212, and you call 988, you're likely gonna get routed to a call center in New York. Um, if you are, uh, have a Virginia phone and you live in California, you're gonna get routed to us. Um, so what we know is that local call centers um, are best positioned to respond to local needs, right? We know what those resources are that are available in our communities. We partner very closely with the, both the public and private uh, behavioral health sector. Um, the level of, of structure and formality that exists today is just unbelievable. Um, call centers, I used to think, were, were sort of out here, outside of the system. And now we're really that front door for a lot of people that are coming into the system. We're able to resolve about 80% of calls that come in at the call center level, uh, meaning we're able to de-escalate folks that are in crisis. 
but anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of people that call the call center um, need to be connected to other community resources, and that's a critical role for us. So uh, back in the day when we had crisis workers just to answer calls, and that was our primary resource, uh, today we have care navigators. We have licensed clinicians that are part of, uh, of our team. Um, we have dispatchers to dispatch mobile crisis units as part of that. So um, through the investment of, of SAMHSA, we're able to really be more responsive to the needs of the community around crisis. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks to everyone for all, all of that information. I know that I'm learning just sitting here listening. Uh, is, you know, taking all that into account, when it comes to stigma around mental health, uh, you know, we've read, you know, you, you talked about Delta Sigma Theta, uh, we talked about the younger generation, we're talking about the workplace. Um, it, you know, there has been some progress in terms of, especially this younger generation, a little more comfortable about speaking about these challenges and supporting one another. Um, but for whatever barriers still exist, uh, what are your recommendations and what do you see work when it comes to addressing the, the stigma that still can exist? I'll start out by just saying that um, uh, first, uh, I wanted to also thank the administration. Uh, this work takes leadership, it takes tone, and then it takes execution. And um, from the from the president's office to Secretary Becerra to every one of you all as leaders, this takes leadership, tone, and execution. And, and we just want to thank you for what you're doing because all of us take pain and we turn it into purpose. And now is the time. So now let me speak to what you just said. Stigma, get young people involved. We did something because young people don't, they don't, they don't look at it and scale it the way we do. And they don't have the same tolerance. And I'll give you a practical example. Last year we put out a call to action and an application process over 30 days for 10 young people, 25 to 26, 21 to 26 to come and work with us in what we called our next gen work group. Um, and we have only had 10 seats, we had 10 stipends to be able to pay them for monthly for 12 months. Young adults, we got 760 applications. They care about mental health, they want to be engaged, and we had the best and the brightest. All 760 were incredible, but the 10 that were chosen. Well, we, we repeated that cohort this year, and we brought them in. The net net is young people really do address stigma very differently, and they want to accelerate, accelerate change. And this is about evolution, and this is about change. So from our standpoint, we're really very focused on getting more young voices at the table and giving them a seat. Nothing about us without us, and they say, give us a voice. I'll, I'll just add to that. I think another uh, important population to think about are, are peers. Um, you know, peers, particularly trained peers, um, to work in behavioral health um, is, is important because it gives that voice of lived experience. Um, they are so good at talking about their experience and their recovery and sharing that with others. And I think that creates a safe space for people to be able to um, know that they, they're not talking to a licensed therapist. They're talking to somebody who's gone through this. And that helps make it easier for people to reach out for help when they need it. Yeah, from, from the Indian Health Service, uh, one thing that I would like to share, this just came up uh, recently at a a large uh, conference in Anchorage, um, Alaska, with the National Indian Health Board is just the stigma, stigma associated around um, men's health and men in particular um, accessing mental health services in, in rural America. This is certainly um, something we want to uh, explore and um, uh, learning how to uh, communicate, as, as you said, Assistant Secretary, through the different generations. Uh, we have different forms of communications now. It's, it's just amazing. I, I thought I was pretty savvy, but I still cannot keep up with with all the different forms of communication. But it is going to take that innovation and that collective approach, but the attention and listening. 
Yeah, I think I would echo many of uh, the comments that have already been shared and, and just add, I do find uh, hope or, or perhaps promise in the fact that we're talking about mental health to the extent that we are today. Um, I also know, and for many in this room, we've been at this for decades. Uh, and so yes, absolutely there is promise and absolutely there are moments of optimism because we're talking about mental health uh, in, a, in a new and different way, but there is still a lot of work to do. And our message for employers is that mental health is already impacting your workforce. That's one of the reasons why we stood up uh, this, this new initiative is we wanted to bring into one place a set of resources that touch on those best practices for addressing serious mental illness and, and mental health in the workplace, including uh, building robust navigator programs, building and having access to employee assistance programs and the importance of access to treatment. I could easily talk about what those best practices are for, for hours and hours, but I would just point you to uh, that new initiative and the website that we've stood up, but also impress upon you that DOL, uh, along with our, our partner agencies, are collaborators in this effort because it really will take all of us. Thank you all. As I think about stigma, um, too, just from what we see in our work at ACF, um, you know, we talked a lot about the younger generation. I think that's part of it. Um, we've been figuring out, trying to figure out how do we reach parents as well. And we recently held our first parent training on how to support your young people. You know, whether it's your own child, your a child, a friend. You know, your, the friends of your child, just kill kids you know and you're worried about, young adults. Um, we had more, more than 3,000 people show up for this training um, for parents about how to support their young people that they care about. Uh, and so I think it goes back to that, you know, doing this together, we have to be speaking to all generations. Um, and in our work at ACF, we're really trying to do that uh, with our partners. We're learning from a lot of people that are in this room. So in our first panel, we did discuss some of the work that HHS and the administration is doing and others, you know, everyone's basically mentioned some of the ways that of the unprecedented investments that this administration has been able to make uh, to address mental health. Um, can you tell us about other resources that you're aware of or that you provide, that you leverage or um, work with that are also available for the communities that you're working in and serve? I'll go ahead and start from the Indian Health Service. I, I think uh, the key question is who can provide the services? What resources are available um, at the Indian Health Service, especially over the, what we've all experienced over these past couple of years is accessing services. And so uh, one resource that we really maximized on is our Telebehavioral Health Center for Excellence which um, we were able to, just uh, last year alone in fiscal year 22, we were able to provide over 6,000 hours of, of telehealth, uh, either through counseling, uh, telepsychiatry, you, you name it. Um, it's just amazing to look at the demand and how we were able to deliver. Uh, but coupled with that is understanding just the real nature of the majority of the Indian health system as a whole is that that need and demand for continued education to keep up with licensure. And so we also had to find solutions to ensure that training was making it across our system. Uh, training on grief, um, on topics that you know aren't traditionally um, requested <laughs> in this forum. Uh, this led to the development of what we call critical response teams in 10 of our IHS areas where we develop targeted teams that can really provide that resources to clinical um, staff on hand um, in, the, in the area of mental health. And then finally is just looking at um, the strategies that are at play right now with, with a paraprofessional workforce in diverse settings. At the Indian Health Service, we've had a long-standing um, uh, paraprofessional provider type, 
which we call community health representatives, which really serve as a, a bridge at that very local level in reaching out to the community, helping them to navigate the resources on the health side and also on the human services side, uh, but also another provider type, which is our community health aid program. This has been in play in the state of Alaska since the late 60s, and we are just now um, currently looking at expanding that program outside of Alaska. If you've been there, they'll say down to the 40, lower 48. <laughs> Uh, but this has really proven effective in, in bringing those uh, community leaders who are interested in health, whether it's um, community health, uh, behavioral health, we're now exploring even mental health aids um, or even dental health aids. And within the context of the trauma-informed uh, approach that I shared earlier, each of these provider types are, in, are trained to help help identify those, those needs uh, around uh, mental and behavioral health. So those are just a couple resources in addition to partnership. I think partnership, partnership, partnership is key. Uh, certainly we can't do it alone. We partner with all of our operating divisions here at Health and Human Services as well as across government. Thanks. Uh, I will just add maybe a, a few more resources. I already talked about a few, but one is our job accommodation network or ashjan.org. That is a source of free confidential uh, guidance around and resources and expert advice around accommodations in the workplace, including for those who are living with mental health conditions. I can never talk enough about Jan. I've used it uh, as a as a worker, as an employee with a non-apparent disability, I've used it as a manager, and it is a resource for those employees and employers who are in the job and wondering what supports they have available. Two other resources I would mention is one, our askearn.org, and that is our employer assistance and resource network for disability inclusion, where we have an entire resource focused on what does this look like in the workplace? What would it look like to build a robust infrastructure in the workplace to address mental health? on the job. Uh, what does it mean to build a mentally healthy workplace? And it talks about accommodations, assistance, access to treatment, and the steps we can take to build awareness. And then one final initiative that I um, often talk about and I think is important is work that we're doing in states. Uh, something called the Aspire Initiative. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we always have a lot of acronyms, and this is the Advancing State Policy uh, integration for recovery and employment. And it's specifically working in seven states, providing technical assistance to state agencies in order to ensure that they can coordinate to provide IPS to individuals living with serious mental illness. We know and understand in our agency and throughout DOL that mental health is a continuum and we want to ensure that employment is not out of reach for anyone. And so that is another initiative that uh, we do quite a bit of investment in. Thank you. I think we have just a few minutes left, but we wanted to allow for one question. Jonah Cunningham from the National Association of County Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Directors. My question is shorter than the title of my organization. <laughs> but you guys mentioned a lot, talked a lot about trauma and grief, but I'm curious, looking the other way, if you could comment on some of the work you're doing, uh, really strengthening protective factors, things like community connectedness. I think that's at the center of a lot of the prevention work that's happening at HHS. Um, you know, where, how, where do we start before a crisis occurs? Um, and recognizing that, uh, you know, all the other work we do at HHS, domestic violence, uh, uh, financial stability, um, you know, family uh, unity and, and helping families stay intact with, with supports comes into play there. Uh, but I'll turn it to our panelists to see what they have to add here. And thank you, it's a very important question. 
I think uh, early intervention and getting to people uh, very early. Uh, we have support programs that we do in communities across the country, evidence-based programs that family to family, peer to peer, as you were speaking of, and, and it's, it's about making, making sure that people know they're not alone. And I'm seeing someone across from me that is navigating the same thing I am, and we navigate that with them. Uh, in terms of uh, other work, we, we collaborate with other organizations on wellness and saying not what's wrong, but what's well. And we know that there's a lot of organizations that are really trying to, to, to proactively uh, get to the communities. We know a young person, if you, it's 11 years from the time there's a, there's a, a, a mental illness that, de uh, that, that develops and when they get care. Well, we want to we wanna really reverse that and get to them early. You can take a 14-year-old. They don't get care until they're 25. So what can we do to, 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 to address that? We think about our, our, our evening news. Our evening news in that 22 minutes of, of, of drive time on that evening news is not talking about all the things that are going well. So that's what we're trying to do as agencies. Um, I'll just add a couple of uh, quick things that we're doing. One is um, that we operate a first episode psychosis program, coordinated specialty care program, um, that really works um, at targeting people experiencing their first psychotic episode uh, beginning as early as age 15 uh, for early intervention. And that wraparound um, service includes such things as supported education and supported employment, which is key. We also are a provider of individual supported employment as well. And I just want to quickly touch on families. One other service that we operate is the Family Peer Support Partner Program, uh, which is uh, parents that are trained to work with parents with children that are experiencing mental health or substance use issues, and their, their role is not to support the child, but to support the parents, to help them navigate the system of care, uh, and to help them advocate for themselves to make sure that, that their children are able to get the services they need as soon as they can get them. I think one additional thing that I would add is I talk a lot about employees, and you heard me say employees, but we at the Department of Labor also work to support job seekers. And the, the theory of change, our, our mission is that employment is key. It is a stabilizing factor for so many communities and it, it is a contributing factor to mental health. And so we have a wealth of resources and investments, including our network of American job centers around the nation, across the territories that provide resources and support in getting to employment for job seekers. And we think that is a, a key part of this conversation as well. Um, in terms of collaboration, one of the other things that we've done is uh, we have um, partnered to create the CEO Alliance on uh, Mental, uh, mental um, uh, Health. And that organization represents 15 CEOs, 15 organizations that are uh, all engaged in looking at a platform that includes seven areas of focus. Uh, in terms of making change and seeing how we can uh, alter the current state of mental health and what we called before COVID a fragmented mental health system. So if it was fragmented before, what does it look like now? And this group, this cohort of 15 CEOs are demonstrating their leadership to actually create uh, different areas that we can collaborate on to make change. Thank you. Well, I want to thank our panelists. Thank you for the leadership that you're um, demonstrating every day and thanks to everyone in this audience here uh, virtually we know you're here because you are doing this work every day in my work as the assistant secretary for the administration for children and families I meet with you youth young adults families all the time providers uh, I do certainly get moments of laughter in uh, classrooms with kids having fun but I also am in rooms with a lot of tears a lot of heartache, a lot of overcoming very tough obstacles, uh, but sometimes they're still in the middle of that or they know there might be one right around the corner. So I want to thank everyone who's here, everyone in this stage doing their part and everyone who's been a part of this program today and all those out there who are doing this work in the community every single day to support people who really need community to be there. So I'm very proud to be here with all of you and with my colleagues. Thank you.
Thank you so much to Assistant Secretary Contreras and our panelists for that wonderful discussion. State and local communities are essential partners in our efforts to transform mental health care and also leaders and in laboratories and in innovation for uh, developing solutions to meet the needs of their unique communities. So we are always excited to learn from our community partners. And for that reason, I'm really thrilled about this next conversation. I'm with two of those partners, Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott and Chatham County Commissioner Helen Stone. The conversation will be moderated by Rachel Pryor, Senior Counselor to the Secretary of HHS. All right, last panel before lunch, uh, but it's gonna be a really good one, so get excited. Um, so I have the, the distinct honor and pleasure of being here with Mayor Scott, Commissioner Stone. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier today about the importance of implementation. Uh, I am here to share that implementation happens at the local level, the real implementation when you are looking into someone's face. Um, it, is, it is human and it's real and the folks that I am privileged to be sitting here with, um, they do that every day. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in because we don't have a ton of time uh, and I want you all to be able to, to hear from our amazing panelists here today. So Mayor Scott, um, I'm gonna start with you if that's okay. Um, so uh, if we could start with some of your background on um, what you have done to address violence in Baltimore and, and trauma caused by gun violence and how you've approached the mental health response. Um, I think there's been some really interesting stuff happening in Baltimore. I think we've all watched that and watched your response and I think it'd be a great way to just jump right in there to a really tough topic and, and hear about how you're handling that in your city. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for that. And listen, I always say that uh, Baltimore's longest standing public health issue has been gun violence as a young man that was born into a city that had 300 murders a year and for most, most of my life we have in the same but uh, for far too long we looked at that as solely the responsibility of police right uh, we put everything on the backs of our police officers and now as my grandmother would say since we know better we have to do better and what we've been doing uh, Baltimore of course uh, really following the death of Freddie Gray and the unrest that came from there we were at a reckoning of where folks had to realize how we could do things in a different way. Uh, so uh, as when I became mayor, we introduced and put out Baltimore's first ever comprehensive violence reduction strategy that included policing but didn't solely focus on that, right? Uh, we have been expanding our violence intervention work and growing what we call a community violence intervention ecosystem that includes our Safe Streets Violence Interrupters that go out into neighborhoods like East and West Baltimore have been proven through Johns Hopkins now to reduce homicides and shooting by over 20% in the areas that they work. But we're taking that to the next level too. We're doing that also in schools, that violence intervention work. We're supporting the trauma work that is happening in, in our city. We're leading uh, with our partners that happen to be in the front row in Baltimore by alleviating uh, calls for service that we're going to police that are now going to our behavioral health partners to have them respond in the way that we can focus on violence in every single angle and not have to allow it to be this conversation that we hear from pundits that you either have to police or do everything else. This is a both and approach and it's the only way that we're truly gonna to get to the, the core of this. And I was blessed uh, uh, by the president with $641 million of OPA funds. Yay. Uh, yay, 50 million of that we put directly. <laughs> $50 million of that opera for Baltimore is going directly into that strategy that we're going to have. We've launched, launched our group violence reduction strategy program where we go to those who are most at risk in our city. Not guessing. Uh, when I was growing up in, in Baltimore, if you were breathing in black and walking and talking and maybe even rolling down the street in a stroller, you could be put in handcuffs and set on the curb for just simply being where you, where you were. I always tell folks that it, I am lucky 
that none of the seven times that I had handcuffs put on me actually ended up with me going into Central Brookings for, for an arrest. Imagine what the history of the city would look like if that actually happened and my life was ruined simply because I was driving home from college or I was outside with my friends or I walked out of the store at a, at a certain time. Uh, but uh, we go to those people and we say, we want you to change your life, right? Offer them those services. And what do those services look like? For many, that's substance abuse, that's mental health, that's job training, that's housing, all of these things, and say, take this, take this, but if you don't, then we're gonna bring in law enforcement. And we've seen, we started in one district last year, the Western, which was our uh, most violent, we saw a 34% reduction in, in homicides and non-fatal shootings, and now we're expanding that to the Southwest District, which is now running a 50% reduction, which is actually pushing Baltimore as we, as we stand right now, with all of that intensive work to be uh, bucking, bucking a trend. We have a 21% reduction in homicides when we're seeing cities across the country have increases in, in those numbers. And that's just the beginning of the work. We'll get into some of our behavioral health work as we go on. I, I mean, I have so many things that I want to say. Um, that is, that it's incredible. I love hearing that as a former Baltimore City social worker. I want to thank you for that um, and thank you for um, your approach to, and we talked a little bit about this backstage, I think all three of us, that it is not, an, it is a nuanced issue, it is an issue that takes families, that takes communities. Um, it is not a situation where we can address only one part of the problem, it's multi-layered, so I loved hearing ecosystem, I think that's exactly the right, um, right framing, and I loved hearing about that money. Um, because I think that's something that we've really focused on with the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is focusing on schools. We'll take all the money we can get. <laughs> exactly, right? We're, we're just going to try to do that. Um, so, you know, picking up a little bit on what you were saying around incarceration and setting people up for success. Commissioner Stone, I wanted to talk a little bit with you about your efforts at Chatham County. So going to a very different part of our country, right? Going to Georgia now, um, going on the ground to Savannah and, and the rest of Chatham County down there. I think I'm right that it's Savannah, right? That's correct. Um, so, so I wanted to, you know, and I know folks probably saw we recently released a, an opportunity in our Medicaid program for a new 1115 demonstration waiver to cover folks um, in carceral settings, you know, for in the days of the pre-release period so that we can get them connected to the community more effectively, make sure they leave with what they need. Um, but there are a lot of other things, I think, also that you've been doing in Chatham County, whether it's a new diversion facility or, or leveraging how to connect services to folks that that need the help, right? Because we want to set people up for success, I think. Um, so talk to us a little bit about that. Thank you, Rachel. Um, the release of the HHS guideline on Medicaid reentry was a significant, I mean significant victory to counties. Providing progress on our long-term priority to improve care continuity and health outcomes for individuals who are justice involved. We appreciate HHS's partnership and the incorporation of the county perspective in the design of this demonstration opportunity, which will effectively amend the Medicaid inmate exclusion policy in selected states by allowing incarcerated individuals to receive health services under Medicaid at least 30 days, 30 days, prior to their release from jail or prison. The Medicaid inmate exclusion policy creates disruptions in care continuity that has devastating effects on the rates of untreated mental illness and substance abuse disorder in our communities, particularly for individuals who are being detained in our county jails prior, prior to due process and those that are going to re-enter our communities. County governments are required by law to provide adequate care to the 11 million individuals that cycle through 3,000 local jails each year. Get your arms around those numbers. 11 million people. More than 95% of those incarcerated in local jails eventually return to their communities, bringing their health conditions with them. 
Even if individuals are released from jail quickly, it often takes weeks or months for their previous health care coverage to restart, making immediate, uninterrupted access to vital treatment virtually impossible. Many of these individuals have mental health or substance use issues, with serious mental illness being three to four times more prevalent among jail inmates than in our general populations. So in Chatham County, approximately 40% of individuals detained in our, Ch our Chatham County Detention Center have a diagnose, diagnosis of mental illness, substance abuse disorder, or co-occurring health challenges. As of yesterday, we had 1,281 individuals. Of that, 558 are associated with behavioral health disorders and 28 are on a wait list for Georgia Regional Hospital, which is our um, mental health hospital. 5% of those are awaiting forensic evaluation at state hospitals to determine competency to stand trial. The lack of care continuity increases the likelihood of jail recidivism and burdens other local systems of care such as our hospitals and our emergency rooms. As part of this demonstration opportunity, counties and participating states will have the ability to expand access to vital mental health and addiction services, decreasing recidivism, improving health outcomes for individual, individuals that are reentering our community, and also while reducing health care and criminal justice cost. That's another big issue is the cost of our, our courts and how backlogged because of all this our courts currently are. So through the National Association of Counties, we have been encouraging counties to work with states to apply for this new opportunity. However, our work to improve care continuity does not end there. We must also address the inequitable loss of health care benefits for individuals who have not been adjudicated in our local jails due to the Medicaid and Med exclusion policy. 60% of the people in our local jails are awaiting trial and have not been convicted of a crime. Now that's a national statistic. I hate to say it, but in Chatham County it's 90%. So on, a, on any given day, 90% of individuals housed at the Chatham County Detention Center are awaiting trial. About 15% of that population are awaiting a federal court date. Chatham County allocated the American Rescue Plan Act recovery funds to reduce the judicial caseload backlog. Case load backlog. We're started, when we started this initiative in October of 2021 and the commission had to evaluate their priorities, there were more than 25,000 cases in Chatham County considered backlogged. The team representative, all members of the judicial staff, we've worked to re together to reduce that by about 40% as of today. So alongside the regulatory measures that have recently been taken, counties are supportive of bipartisan legislation and additional regulatory measures that would greatly improve care coordination in our local jails for both pretrial and reentry populations and that would enhance our ability to provide effective behavioral health treatment and services that allow for a smooth transition to community care. Consistent and coordinated federal health benefits for non-convicted and individuals engaging in recovery would allow for improved care, lower cost to taxpayers, and long-term government expenditures, decrease crime, reduce recidivism, improve public safety, and facilitate better outcomes for the overall health of our residents. We believe that the opportunity provided by the CMS demonstration is just the beginning of creating a better system of care continuity for justice-involved individuals. So thank you for that. I'm sorry the answer was a little lengthy. <laughs> <laughs> it's an important topic, so I, I think it's important that we cover it, right? Um, so 
I think that's, you know, we've talked a little bit about the response, the services that we can provide, um, you know, that it needs to be across the continuum. All of that, I think, does mean a lot. I think we need to do more. We need to get more money. Um, but I, you know, I also think there's a culture shift that needs to happen. There's culture change that needs to happen in Mayor Scott. I think you've done a lot of that in the city of Baltimore, which is no small feat. Um, what do you think is, you know, and I realize this is kind of a um, loaded question, but what do you think is the secret sauce there? How do you leave lasting culture impact, culture change through the policies that you're creating in Baltimore City? Well, you just have to do it and be unafraid <laughs> to change it, right? I think if, we, if I always say to my team and folks when we talk about these big cultural shifts, you know, I always just leave it very simple. I was like, or we can do what we've been doing and we see how right. that's been working, right? That's the reality. We can continue to send police officers out for folks uh, experiencing mental health and substance abuse issues and we know that they're not trained. And in Baltimore, I put it very plainly, I said, we're the home of Johns Hopkins. If any city should be able to get it right, if we have 11 hospitals, all right. these behavioral health, mental health experts that you will not find anywhere else in the country, we have them. If we can do it, then everyone else can do it. If we can't, then no one can. But we should be the first in doing it. And it's really about also thinking even beyond the walls of the city, right? Baltimore is unique. Right. Baltimore and St. Louis are independent cities. We don't exist within a county. But for us, even we were the first city uh, to have a regional 988 campaign. We put that together with so the city cool. and the county, co-locating those things, putting it in the cloud, because we also know that there's a resource strain, not just on city government, but on behavioral health and providers as well. Everyone is going through those same things. And that's a way that we can show and lead by example. But even when you think about some of the other work that we've done, right? We are one of the first cities to start this big 911 diversion program, right? Where Very we're cool. taking police away, working with our partners at BHSB and BCR, BCRI to do that work. And then how do we then expand that work? How do we think about that? How do we follow the guidelines? Baltimore gets 13,000 911 calls for folks who are experiencing mental health or overdose emergencies. My police officers are very well trained. They are not trained for that, right? That is not their expertise. And we should not be sitting in that. And we've seen time and time again how that, how that ends up. But to the contrary, I'm also a city where we see 2,600 guns last year. I want them focused on that. Those are the things that they get paid to do. We have behavioral health folks who spent their entirety of their lives being trained in this work. We should be allowing them to do that work. And we know that this approach follows the, the SAMHSA guidelines, which we know are evolving. But also, uh, we started initially with that, with two suicidal ideation call types of 988. We've now expanded that to a third. We're blessed to have in Baltimore and in Maryland great a great federal team in our congressional delegation. You won't find a better one anywhere in the country, right? And Senator Van Hollen actually championed and secured for us $2 million to expand this diversion program. We're using that, that earmark to create youth-focused mobile crisis team, which uh, with Very community cool. members and stakeholders identify as a priority. We're co-locating behavioral health clinician inside the 911 call center to support our call takers in de-escalating crises and con conducting screening to determine the most appropriate response. Uh, that kind of landscape is going to continue to change, but we have to do that by investing in creating even more mobile response teams and increasing capacity to respond to, to the way that we need to, expanding the walk-in capacity of community-based mental health and substance abuse clinics, creating more affordable, uh, permanent supportive housing, and really reimagining outreach and valuing the role uh, that everyone plays in that system. Because if it were up to me, all 13,000 of those calls will go out to a behavioral health partner. But we have to build up our partners to be able to take that work. And that's a lot of systems change work that has to happen not just in with city government and 911 and police and fire, but with our hospitals and what they're totally. doing and their partners and their, and their ability to, and our ability not to have our emergency rooms be a catch-all, allowing that we are giving people the appropriate service where and when they need it. And that's big cultural and system change that has to happen. And there I say it can't happen only 
with local and federal government. We need the state governments to play a big part in that. Everyone needs to be on the same page of how we can really reimagine how we're bringing these services to Baltimoreans, to Marylanders, and more importantly, as we talk here today, Americans who need these services because we cannot continue to do what we've been doing. We're losing so many people uh, to mental health. We're losing so many people to substance abuse that we do not have to if we do what works. We know these things work. We just have to invest them in further. I think that's exactly right. I know, right? <laughs> I think, you know, I love, um, I love how you framed that because I do think culture change to some degree is just start doing it, right? Just start doing it. And then, you know, people being in that environment, people seeing it, people feeling it, it drives that change because they feel it. They feel that it works. They feel that it's making a difference. And I, you know, and I, um, I think 988 has really been a catalyst. Um, around the country for us to think about mental health in a different way, think about what we put on the backs of, of our police in a different way, think about how we respond um, across the board in a different way. And so, um, you know, I love it, just do it, <laughs> which is great. Um, you know, so I, you know, I, I know we're running low on time and I know everybody's like staring over there at their, at their lunch boxes. Uh, but, you know, one, one last question, one last quick question, and then I'll wrap us up, I promise. Um, you know, thinking back on, on a little bit of what Mayor Scott was saying with um, how we've got to sort of take what's happening at the local level and scale it up, um, I want, uh, wonder if Commissioner Stone, you can talk a little bit about uh, the new Commission on Mental Health and Wellbeing at, at NACO and, and how, um, what you're hoping to accomplish with your leadership there and how counties are engaging in our national mental health crisis. Thank you for that question. I'm really proud of what NACO has done here and I'm honored to take part in this transformative, transformative work that will take th place through NACO's Commission on Mental Health and Wellbeing. As a county official, I can attest to the fact that direct mental health services, delivery responsibilities are, are falling increasingly to American counties, America's counties. We serve as the nation's safety net for residents in need through our role by our first responders and our operators of crisis lines, our public hospitals, and our detention centers. And that last phrase, I really hate, our detention centers. Counties are, an integ are integral, to in integral to any local, state, or national level effort to strengthen mental health services because of the various touch points we have among residents seeking care. Seventy-five percent of the U.S. population is reliant on county-based behavioral services through more than the 750 county supported uh, and are operated behavioral health authorities. Counties also own or contribute to the operation and the governance of more than 1,000 public hospitals and clinics which will administer health services. However, as we are all aware, the mental health crisis that our nation is currently facing is a dire situation and the one that demands a comprehensive whole of government solution. We as counties are ready to work across the public and private sectors to curb this growing crisis through specific federal policy, increased awareness, and steadfast collaboration. Collaboration, folks. This is exactly what we hope to accomplish through the work of this new commission. NACO's Commission on Mental Health and Well-Being was launched in this past February, February of 2023, and brings together county leaders from across the nation to take action to address the ever-growing mental health crisis from the county government's perspective. Through this commission, NACO elevates the critical role that counties play in providing high quality, accessible mental health services. We showcase community innovations and solutions, and it outlines the intergovernmental and public-private partnership required to reimagine and strengthen our nation's mental health policies, programs, and practices. 
through the advancement of the, the Chatham County, um, excuse me, through the advancement of county policy priorities, showcasing community strategies, and elevating county voices, this commission has four goals. Number one, first, create a national sense of urgency through an intergovernmental partnership framework for addressing our nation's crisis with mental health and the well-being of our residents, especially our most vulnerable. Second, elevate the national awareness of the roles, innovations, and pain points that are facing our county governments in addressing this escalating crisis. Thirdly, achieve public uh, policies that support the county role in safeguarding the nation's mental and behavioral wellness. And lastly, align a cohesive national intergovernmental strategy to improve and enhance the mental health and well-being of all Americans with a special focus on our most vulnerable population. That's wonderful. Yes. I think that uh, we are very excited, I think, to hear more about what the commission well, is going to do, do in the coming you year. Can do that. <laughs> you can go on NACO's website and you can look up the toolkit that this um, commission is sponsoring. Awesome. And I just can't tell you uh, the amount of work that they've put into this and the challenges that we are facing. We're ready to dive in. This is a, a wonderful commission, and I'm just very excited to be a part of it. That's wonderful. I, uh, I am going to wrap us up only because we, uh, I'm, getting all the, I'm getting all the time cards. I'm getting all of them. <laughs> Uh, and I could sit with you all all day, I think, because we've got a lot to learn. Um, you know, I think we have a lot to learn from what's happening at the local level, and we have a lot to learn about how we can do better, how we can create that culture change, that culture shift. Um, and, you know, look forward to working with you all more. Uh, it has been a pleasure uh, to be here with, with both of you, and it's been a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, and I am going to kick it back over to our illustrious moderator over there and, and wish you all a happy lunch. So thank you. Thank you. Right. Huge thank you to Rachel um, and Mayor Scott. Um, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, you made it to lunch. So um, uh, thank you all so much. Um, there are a limited amount of sandwiches on the side wall. Um, we also have other options in the area. I believe there should be um, some uh, sheets on your tables that mention local lunch options. Um, so um, we'll reconvene around 1255. Um, please also visit the photo wall if you can. If you're using social media, um, recall our um, hashtag is strength and mental health. Um, and uh, enjoy lunch and we'll be back for more afterwards. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.